very, very, very strange. That's because normally you would imagine. Right. You have, the, you have the assets to set up a trust. <laughs> but nevertheless. Or an estate to administer. Yeah. <laughs> you guys ready? Good evening. To call this meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals to order, please. Um, we have a couple of housekeeping matters we have to take care of before we can get to the actual appeals, so we will uh, we'll try to move through those as quickly as we can. Um, the first order of business is to approve the minutes from our last meeting way back on March 27th of 2012. Um, do I have a motion on that? Motion to approve the minutes of March 27th, 2012. Is there a second? Seconded. Okay. All in favor? So approved. Second. Um, the next order of business is, um, I believe that we have someone here from the town council, or at least that was envisioned, who is going to talk about uh, town way issues. Good evening. See you in a different. Yes, session. it's a little behind a podium, though. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, well, my name is Jim Walsh, and I'm a uh, town councilor here in Cape Elizabeth, and. Um, I was also on the zoning board for six years, and the six years I was on the zoning board, we never had this many people come to a meeting. So <laughs> I'm glad that we're doing the people's business here. Um, one of the uh, decisions made by the town council this year was when we ever uh, enacted a new piece of legislation in the town or referred anything to a board, a member of the town council who was assigned as a liaison would then go to that particular board and inform that board of something new, some new responsibility that the board may have. So in this case, we have the Townways Ordinance, which is uh, Chapter 17 in the Town Ordinance. And uh, about, uh, it's about a year ago now, uh, Stonegate, um, there was a sale of some land and two lots that uh, the particular developer decided to apply for a driveway permit and bring one of those lots out onto Stonegate Road. Obviously, there was a lot of controversy and discussion about it. This particular board actually heard one of the questions about that. And the town council itself wound up being um, appealed to as the final sort of decision maker, if you will, relative to whether that particular building permit was issued properly. So after that process, it went to court, and there was a lot of discussion, and things were settled um, to the satisfaction of both parties. The town council decided to ask the ordinance committee to look at this question and to go back to this particular section of the ordinance and to address uh, some of the things that needed to be updated. And so I would like to just explain to you a couple of those and then, uh, and then get out of your way so you can get on with the business of tonight's meeting. Basically, the, the town ways ordinance, uh, it, uh, anyone who wishes to connect to a town road must obtain an entrance permit from the public works director. The Public Works Director applies standards to determine if the permit will be issued. His decision is currently appealed in, uh, as of last month uh, to the Town Council. The amendment that was adopted after a final hearing in front of the Town Council will go into effect on the 10th of October, and that amendment will designate the Zoning Board as the place where that appeal will be heard going forward. The second issue that was cleaned up in this particular ordinance was a standard has been incorporated to, as a concept of access management, something used in the permit process. This concept has been found or been around for about 20 years, wasn't included in our original uh, statute. The goal is to preserve capacity and safety on town roads by minimizing new curb cuts that will still allow every lot for vehicular access. The third issue that we cleaned up was we applied the site distances that are in our current subdivision ordinance to this particular ordinance. Again, more consistency being applied across legislation here in Cape Elizabeth. Final piece is a standard has been updated to recognize that hardscape pavers are an acceptable part of the ordinance. That currently is not in there and effective on the 10th of October. That will be allowed. Um, and the final piece, just to reiterate, you now as the zoning board will be the appeal uh, body that will look at whatever is decided by the public works director. And again, um, we appreciate the, uh, the fact that you'll be taking on this uh, responsibility. We think it's the appropriate place for it to be. Um, the town council has been reviewing all of its ordinances to make sure 
that things are up to date and then some of the current thinking that exhibits uh, itself in other ordinances and other communities similar to ours is being applied appropriately. So I thank you again for your service. Um, I appreciate the work that you do. I understand the work you've done and continue to do, having been on this uh, board for six years. And again, as uh, your liaison to the town council, I want to thank you on behalf of my colleagues for the work that you've done. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. <clears throat> Are there any other communications uh, to come before the board this, this, this evening? Okay. Hearing none, I think we can turn to our new business. Um, is, a, is, a, is a sort of housekeeping logistical matter here. It appears that we have four issues to be heard here, two of which are related as, it, as they both arise out of uh, administrative appeals by Mr. and Mrs. Murphy. Um, we also have an application by Raymond Taylor and an application by Betty Jane Shreve. Um, it appears to me that the applications of uh, Mr. Taylor and Ms. Shreve are um, a little more straightforward than the administrative appeals of Mr. Murphy and Mr. and Mrs. Murphy. So, unless anyone on the board disagrees, I suggest that we deal with uh, Mr. Taylor and Mrs. Shreve first and let them go on their way. Okay, let's begin with uh, with Mr. Taylor. Is he here? Good evening, Mr. Taylor. I am here this evening. Uh, to see if I can get a um, get permission to be able to have an employee from time to time to help me in my auto detailing business at uh, 2 Harrison Avenue. And um, that's ba basically pretty straightforward, and that's basically it. Uh, there's no, in, no real increase in my business per se. It's just going to help it run a little more efficiently than it now is. Okay. That's basically it. Um, that, that was actually the first question that I had was, do you, you're telling us you don't anticipate an increase in the volume of the actual vehicles that you'll no, be detailing? Nothing's going to be changing in that respect, no. Okay. And um, do you have any provisions for where the employee would park or how we would get to I it? have off-site parking available. Okay. And where is that? Uh, in the church parking lot, I have permission from the people at, at the Mormon church to park. Uh, cars there across 77. Correct. Okay. So there, so it's safe to say then that there wouldn't be any additional vehicles in front of the in front of the house or or, in, or not at the all house beyond what you already have. That's correct. That's correct. Does anyone else have any questions for Mr. Taylor? Have there been any other changes to your operation since it was originally approved by this board? No changes at all. So all of the other standards, compliance with all of the other conditional use standards remains the same? Correct. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, have you seen um, some of the uh, correspondence that the board has seen around? Uh, I have. In, both in support and I guess not support of the application? Correct. Okay. I guess I'm just looking at uh, Sheila Roy's uh, concerns expressed mm -hmm. in an email of Sunday, uh, September 23rd. I wonder if you could speak to that. Um, yeah. Um, there was a concern that I remember seeing um, about um, creating a slight congestion in, in the, in the, with, with the cars in front of the house, which are our cars, actually. Um, it is momentary. Um, sometimes I have to pull cars in and out, out of the driveway, and that's the only congestion, per se. Uh, there have also been um, sometimes uh, people tend to go fairly quickly coming off Route 77 um, onto Harrison Avenue. And we, from time to time, deliberately park cars out on that road because it seems to act as a buffer and sl actually slows people down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, um, I also take issue to one of the issues she brought up um, that uh, I think it had to do with uh, there is no, this is not going to adversely affect any traffic in any way. It's a, it, basically that's it. Um, and she mentioned something about uh, the possibility of values of pro property values going down, which I take uh, issue with. There's no, no basis for that at all. 
Um, I'm just, I guess, curious how, uh, about diving into the, how your business operates, mm -hmm. how, how will the additional employee, I guess, improve the efficiencies? I, mean, I, I guess that from my perspective, if you're adding an employee that should almost by extension lead to uh, hopefully more business. Right. No, um, in, in this particular case, I have a, a medical condition as well that'll, that'll help. Um, with that, sometimes I just need the help um, when I can't do it myself. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's you know, and in, in the excuse me, and, and in the you know, in, in in the winter, I have little or no business at all to speak of, um, comparatively speaking. It's just only during a few months during the uh, busy seasons, primarily the spring and the summer, mm -hmm. that I see the need for additional help. So you see this is kind of a seasonal? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How many cars are parked on the street at, on any given day? Did you say just No one? customer cars at right. all, ever. But personal cars, one? Personal two. cars, maybe one. And then, you know, when my wife gets home in the afternoon for a short period of time. Is that every day or some no. days? No, it's not. About how many days a week, would you say? Oh, a couple. Okay. And how many months of the year do you think that the employee will be working? Three, four, five? It's sporadic. Um, you know, it, 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 it can be a um, few weeks straight, and then I'll go weeks without even needing anybody. This is more on an as-needed, when-needed basis, mm -hmm. um, strictly. Uh, I, mean, I, I go months, two or three months, without needing any help at all. Is anyone else in the in the audience like to be heard? Okay. Come on up. <clears throat> My name is Libby Barrett. I live on uh, Spurwink Avenue. Um, I'm curious about when this business was established. There, there. I can't see from where I am, but I can hear, and I believe it's coming from this business. I don't know the correct term. It, uh, loud. Mr. Taylor, where are you? Oh, do you use some kind of pump or generated something in your business? Because I hear a loud noise that I'm assuming comes from your business. Not all the time. Some automated something that you use. No, not a vacuum. This sounds more like a pump. I don't know, a pumped water or pumped something. I don't know. I have a conversation. Mr. Taylor, he needs to come up, too. Okay. Why don't you, why don't you come up, too, Mr. Taylor? Can you describe exactly what it is Well, I know. Um, because I'm not mechanical, I, it's hard for me to guess, but almost like a generator sound or well, a power washer. Well, that would be it, the power washer. I'm not sure that that is an issue that's probably before us today. Um, but it, it concerns me because I'm afraid it's, he says his business isn't going to increase, but, and, and the question was asked whether anything had changed since it was approved, and so I'm just wondering, was that in the original approval? M Mr. Taylor, we always used a power washer. I don't, I don't think we ever addressed anything about that. I mean, I use many different things in, in the, uh, the operation of my business. Vacuums, power washers. I can hear the vacuum too, but it's uh, not that. But the power washer is quite loud if I can hear it on Spurwink. So that's just a concern that I have. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right. Close the public discussion now. Um, thoughts? I would simply note that um, it, it appears the business qualifies as a home business to begin with, with the exception of perhaps the noise issue that was just raised. And the home business definition already permits uh, no more than one person who is not a resident. So if, if what is being sought is the ability to have one employee, it already falls within what is otherwise permitted by the home business definition, but 
is not in this case permitted because of the fact that it was a condition that was placed on the conditional granting of the the business application back Correct. in 2002. So removing that restriction um, does not uh, seem bothers, uh, out of the realm of possibility to me. I think that so long as the uh, provision remains that no more than two client uh, vehicles are permitted on the property at any one time, then um, as, as uh, Chris pointed out, the, uh, the ordinance already allows for one additional non-resident employee. Okay. So. I, th I think it would be appropriate to modify the permit as well to say that to the extent the employee is on site that his vehicle, his or her vehicle will be parked off the public roads. Sounds like uh, Mr. Taylor's made an accommodation for that or, or made uh, plans for that, but I think that that would probably be appropriate and should uh, deal with some of the concerns of neighbors about congestion. And I, I would note that that is, seems in compliance with what appears to be one of the existing conditions, which is no personal vehicles on Harrison Avenue while there are client vehicles in the driveway. So this would further note, no, no personal vehicles or employee vehicles. Okay. Anything further in discussion? Do I, uh, do I hear a, should we vote? Anyone want to? I'll move that we um, amend the existing conditional use approval to delete the condition prohibiting one additional employee with a provision that one additional employee is allowed, but that that employee vehicle shall be parked off public roads. Someone have better language for that? I think that, I think, I think that sums it up. Um, I, I, I second that, and I would, I would move that we, with that proviso, that we vote on the various conclusions. Mr. Taylor, do I have a second? Second. Okay. All right. Uh, we will proceed to the conclusions that we have to work through pursuant to the, uh, pursuant to the ordinance. Um, one, the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in the vicinity. All in favor? The proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation. All in favor? The proposed use will not adversely affect the value of the adjacent properties. All in favor? The proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and, the, and with the comprehensive plan. All in favor? And five, I think, is, is irrelevant, but I will say it regardless. The design and external appearance of any proposed building will constitute an attractive and compatible addition to its neighborhood, although it need not have a similar design, appearance, or architecture. All in favor? All right. Uh, I move to approve the application of Mr. Taylor for a revision to the previously approved conditional use permit. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Okay. <coughs> Congratulations, Mr. Taylor. We can next turn to the application of uh, Betty Jane Shreve. Ms. Shreve, come on up. And you're seeking conditional use permit to operate a home business specifically designed to purchase waste paper baskets, pails, and buckets for wholesale and retail distribution. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, about your plan, Ms. Shreve? Well, my plan is to um, um, continue what I've been doing. Uh, uh, basically what I wanted to do was put up a sign and I found I needed to do a little more than just that. So, um, uh, I don't know, several years, about three years ago, I um, 
um, got uh, laid off from work and started to do a hobby that has generated into, evolved rather into a business that now is generating money. And uh, um, so I designed these waste paper baskets um, with a variety of designs from out of copyright like um, JJ Audubon and that type of uh, um, the old vintage style prints to some contemporary artists who I have um, a, uh, a relationship with, a, a business relationship to um, give them a percentage of my sales. Now, um, it, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, go ahead. N no, I, I'll do this all in my property, um, which is the home I live in. Okay. okay. Now, how, how do you build these? Do you use any chemicals or industrial processes or anything like, of that sort? I buy the metal waste paper baskets from a wholesaler in Ohio, um, and then I paint the inside and the outside and um, to match the uh, illustrations that go on the baskets. That's so you're not using any it. manufacturing equipment or anything like that? Or no, no. Paint sprayers or that sort of thing? Um, no, they're cans, you know. Mm -hmm. And are, are you proposing to put a sign up on, on, on your house, ma'am? Yes, that's what I originally went for. Mm -hmm. And what, how, how big of a sign are you? <coughs> well, it'll be in this vicinity, you know. Size. About that size. Yeah, about that size. Any questions? Are you proposing any employees? I'm sorry. Are you proposing any employees? No. I have a helper. Um, uh, the person who lives with me helps me, but she's not employed really. <laughs> um, part of one of the owners is. Nancy Murray Johnson, is that your? My helper and, your, and partner, yes. Okay. She's right there. And but will not be active in the business or is act, will be active in the business? or how? Uh, off and on, there are things that uh, she does to help, but I, there's no compensation for that. Um. Sweat equity, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, she, is she a resident also in, in, the, in the household? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. okay. I guess it's not clear to me why this is a home business and not a home occupation that's permitted. That's a question. It isn't clear to me why this is a home business that requires conditional use approval as opposed to a home occupation that is a permitted use in her zone. Yeah, home, a home occupation, you can't have any clients come regularly, meaning you can't really have sales and you can't have anybody outside the home employed, so that's a difference. I see. Okay. So you do have folks that are regularly visiting the premises? Um, I have deliveries, I have people, uh, wholesale pe people, um, my clients who pick up. Um, it's, the, it's, it's, the retail, it's the retail sales, customers coming in that would trigger the home business. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. customers, do you anticipate customers generally coming to pick up things as opposed to coming to browse? Um, yes, I have somebody coming tomorrow from Cuddle Down who's picking up some waste baskets, and she does that. Okay. I don't know, once every two months. So how, how do you get the how do you get your orders? Or how do you get customers? Do they find you on the on the internet or? They do that, and I've done um, uh, trade shows, the New England Product Trade Show. Uh, that's for wholesale, um, and the main restaurant and lodging this year too. In your application, it, it states that um, the number of vehicle trips per day is, is 10 trips per day. Is that your current number of visits No, per day? that's not my current number. That that's, that's on the outside. That would be like, whoa. <laughs> so that's what you anticipate would be the, the most that would start yes. visiting with the sign? Okay. And how long did someone generally stay? How, will, how long will they stay? Yeah. Um, I mean, these fairly in it, quick in and out sort of visits or? Um, some will if they're picking up, others if I have um, my dining room table filled, you know, then, then uh, some people stay a while and they're like kids in a candy store. So. 
we're just, we're just trying to, I think, I think we're, we're all thinking a little bit to make about congestion in the neighborhood. And, you know, oh, if right. you had 10 cars there at once, it would be sort of a, be sort of a mess down Yeah, there. no, I, I don't foresee that, no. Okay. Okay. So, so you, you're saying that you, you, you anticipate that the maximum that you would probably see in any given day would be 10 vehicles, and those would most likely be spread out over the course of the day? Yes. Well, basically, 10 vehicle trips is five customers. Each oh. each yeah, that's what generates two. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, does anyone else want to be heard on uh, Ms. Shreve's application? Okay. Sir? No. I will. <coughs> I'm, I'm Gary Beckwith uh, uh, on 13 Oakwood Road. I'm a friend of Betty Jane, uh, and I've, we have a couple of examples of her fine artwork. And not only that, but my wife and I, Jane and myself walk down there frequently. You'll see us walking on 77, and we go by their house. And uh, I do not anticipate that any traffic that comes or goes there will be of any hindrance to anybody. Uh, so I stand behind her in her, her request. And a small sign like that, hardly noticed. You know, um, I have a little craft of my own, but I don't hang out at signs. <laughs> I probably have more people park in front of my house than <laughs> Betty Jane will. But anyway, uh, I stand behind her location. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. You probably shouldn't tell him. You tell him. <laughs> <that>. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce will be over to talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> Anyone else? Gary and Jane always hold hands when they go by, too. <laughs> what, I guess I, I do have one follow-up question. What, what proportion of your business would you say would be more retail as opposed to the online variety? I mean, as you kind of look at this business over, say, two years from now, where would you say, um, what would you see that mix being? Retail, uh, well, I would maybe half and half. But you never see yourself really exceeding that, that 10 trips a day? No, I don't. I mean, it's not a gift store, and people aren't just clamoring for these. They, they just, you know, either love them because of their history and... and or, you know, whatever, um, or they're not interested. And will you be anticipating walk-in clients or really just the sign is just to let people know that you have that business there and they'd still be basically visiting by appointment? Yes, I think, in fact, I'll, I'll put that on my sign, yeah, by appointment. We close uh, the public discussion and... Any, any comments internally on the board? Okay, well, let's move to, uh, let's move to voting then. Um, <coughs> on the application of Betty Jane Shreve for conditional use permit for the businesses described herein, um, we'll proceed to conclusions. One, the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. All in favor? The proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation. All in favor? The proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. All in favor? The proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with the comprehensive plan. All in favor? The design and external appearance of any proposed building will constitute an attractive and compatible addition to its neighborhood, although it need not have a similar design, appearance, or architecture. To the extent relevant, all in favor? I right, move to approve the application for uh, Ms. Shreve's conditional use permit. Do I have a second? One second. All in favor? Congratulations, ma'am. <laughs> okay. We're good. Yeah, okay. 
We're going to take a three-minute recess so uh, people can use, use the facilities before we begin. Yeah, go ahead. Associating with them, I'm actually going to be meeting with them next week. Maybe like some other council relationship to start kind of working on my possible contacts again. You know, Freddie has always had trouble getting <laughs> ready for whatever reason. Um, All right, um, I, I, I think we're ready to proceed. Again, I think we're ready to proceed with the, uh, the administrative appeals of. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, um, is, a, is a threshold matter here. As I was reviewing the materials, um, I saw some reference in uh, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy's uh, various things they submitted to the board about uh, a right of way and whether a deck might impinge on that right of way or whether it might not. And my understanding is that a deck is not, the deck is not directly relevant to what we're talking about tonight, but I could not confirm this before the meeting tonight, but I have reason to believe that I, in fact, have, uh, in my family, have uh, rights to that deeded right of way pursuant to our, to our deed in, a, in a one neighborhood over. I don't think that's going to impact my ability to, to rule on this, but I will open that up to both um, the rest of the board for their consideration, and then once they've spoken, if anyone in the, in anyone who's attending wants to uh, be heard on that as well. I will tell you, normally I would just recuse myself as a prophylactic measure, but that leaves us with four, leaves us with a quorum, but only with four people, and I think we need to make a decision as to whether I should recuse myself, and we'll take our chances that it might be a 2-2 split, or we postpone it, or we proceed uh, with, with me participating. So, with that being said, 
I'll what are start the neighborhoods with issues? I mean, I guess my concern would be um, that we would, that any resident, is, is the issue such that any residents of those neighborhoods would have the same conflicts, like folks that live in Shore Acres, for example? Uh, arguably, you know, again, I haven't had a title search done. Is I'm that not 100% certain? And, and there was amended material, I th or there was material we received in the last three days that I thought indicated that one of the structures had the plan had been altered such that it no longer impinged on the right of way. Is that the structure? There was a revision to the permit application for the rock wall. Uh, they had located it, Livingston's located it further back uh, for reasons to, for erosion control and, and the like. So it's not, according to the revision, it's not on the right of way. And was that the only structure that was located on the right of way? That was the only one in question. So does that eliminate the issue then? As, as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't see it's an issue. I just, I know this seems like it's gonna be hotly contested, so I wanted to make sure they were understood. Got it. Anything that might bear on it, I don't think it will bear on it, but anything else from the board? Any comments from uh, any of the interested parties or their counsel? Speak briefly, um, just a Quick synopsis, I, I actually do believe there's a pending appeal specifically with respect to the right of way that's been filed by the association that's not before the board today. You might have to, you might have to address this okay. issue again. Uh, but the right of way <laughs> issue, there, we, we do feel there are some encroachments, but it gets more to the uh, standing argument, if you will, whether or not the uh, Murphys have been impacted. So I have no objection. Not today, and I think we can. Uh, I think we can proceed with uh, the two administrative appeals. Um, and as a procedural matter, I don't know the answer to this, but does the rest of the board then have to take the vote that we don't believe you need to um, recuse yourself? I, I, I don't know the answer to that either. No, you don't have. To. Okay. 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 Um, all right. Well, I guess we can proceed then. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, are there uh, Good evening. Uh, Andre Duchot, I represent the uh, Murphys. Uh, I do want to provide uh, some material to the board, so if you, if you don't mind, if I may approach, uh, I just want to make sure we have a complete record. Thank you for hearing us this evening. Um, I would like to uh, speak, but I, I would also like to reserve some time for uh, Mrs. Murphy to speak as well. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the less that an attorney is up here speaking, the better it is for everyone. Uh, but I would like to at least uh, address uh, some of, the, uh, some of the, the main issues as well as some of the legal arguments that have been uh, presented in front of you. Uh, and, and, I, and I think for the most part I'm going to be speaking uh, this evening uh, with respects to uh, both appeals. Uh, the, the first appeal, uh, I, will, I will address the, uh, the timeliness issue, um, but then, uh, and then as well as the, I, I think one of the uh, main issues of that particular appeal that is not in the uh, subsequent appeal, the patio appeal, if you will, is, is with respects to the height. That being said, uh, the other issues that are presented in both appeals are with respects to whether or not this was a non-conforming structure, whether or not the proper process uh, was followed in this instance uh, to determine whether or not it was a non-conforming structure, and then, and if it is, uh, what procedural mechanisms needed to go f uh, forward. Um, to that end, uh, the, the spirit of the uh, zoning ordinance is to restrict uh, rather than to increase any non-conforming uses and just can secure their gradual elimination. Uh, accordingly, provisions of the zoning regulation for the continuation of such uses should be strictly construed and the provisions limiting non-conforming uses should be liberally construed. The right to continue a non-conforming use is not a perpetual easement to make a use of one's property 
detrimental to his neighbors and forbidden to them. And non-conforming uses will not be permitted to multiply when they are harmful or improper. And that language has been cited in many cases here in the state of Maine, one of which happened to be Two Lights Lobster Shack versus the town of Cape Elizabeth, which was addressed in 1998. <coughs> this is what is at the heart of the Murphy's appeal, both appeals this evening. They have been impacted by a decision of the code enforcement officer, which was in violation of Maine law, the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance, and was, in based, and was based upon improper facts and misrepresentations. As a result, the proper procedures under the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance were not followed, impacting the Murphys and their neighbors, but also potentially impacting the town of Cape Elizabeth as well. The matter once again, this matter once again underscores the concerns raised by three justices on the Maine Supreme Court, encouraging notice to neighbors who will most be affected by proposed construction versus not finding out until after construction begins, which is often after the appeal period has lapsed. Given the broad language in your zoning ordinance, this board does have the ability to hear today's appeal, and it would seem appropriate versus having this matter proceed to Superior Court only to determine that the whether or not the appeal is timely or not, and they got remanded back at a later date before this board. To that end, I want to specifically address some of the, the, the factual allegations raised in Attorney Schumadine's uh, response, which you, you have before you. And I think it also gets uh, to the question of whether or not this matter is timely and whether or not this board has the authority to, to, to hear the arguments today. And that was with respect to as when the Murphys had had notice, um, and there have been uh, cases here in the state of Maine where it's looked at when the abutting neighbor, when the affected neighbors have received notice of, of what's going on, and then from that point in time whether the appeal was timely. Um, it's my understanding that the, uh, the Livingstons had uh, purchased their property and wanted to make uh, renovations, and that was no secret to anyone. Um, and that discussion had started occurring uh, long before the permit was ultimately sought. And you're well aware of the timeline with respect to, I believe it was in uh, June that the, uh, the permit was, was sought and it was issued. But the Murphys didn't, wasn't, weren't aware uh, that the permit was sought and ultimately issued. In fact, there are no, there are no provisions in the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance uh, which says that you have to provide notice to neighbors. In fact, there's no provisions in the Maine Municipal Code which encourages towns to file notice. And again, that's why I highlighted the language uh, from three justices of the Supreme Court who were saying, why do we keep doing this to ourselves? Because this is what happens, and then we find ourselves here in Superior Court back in front of the zoning boards. So like most cases, the Murphys were not aware that a permit had been issued. What they were aware of is when construction material ultimately showed up uh, on, the, on the lawn in front of their house, and they said, oh, you know, Livingston's are going to commence construction. Uh, and that happened uh, much, much later on after the building permit had already been issued. As a result of that, they did seek out uh, the code enforcement officer and wanted to get some background on what was, going to, what was going to occur, what was happening. They wanted to look at the plans. They had asked for materials. And, and again, you see the timeline there uh, with respect to the communications back and forth uh, between uh, Mr. Smith and the Murphys, ultimately being able to schedule uh, a meeting to sit down with them. Unfortunately, that meeting occurred after the deadline, uh, the appeal deadline, as, as stated in the ordinance. Uh, further to that point, it was after that meeting, as well as an on-site meeting, that the Murphys begin to discover that um, I, I, this doesn't you know, this doesn't all seem to add up and this doesn't seem right. They then went about their own investigation to look at both the Cape Elizabeth the zoning ordinance as well as Maine law, and it was based on that investigation that they said, indeed, there, were, there are violations here. Uh, we need to do something, in a, in, and that's when they filed the appeal. At no point was there any notice to them uh, with respects to uh, there being an appeal process as to what that time was. Uh, you're, oh, by the way, uh, thank you for calling me. Uh, you should file an appeal right away. The permit was issued uh, 28 days ago. Nothing along those lines. 
And I think it's based on those facts uh, that you can, you can find today that the appeal was timely, that you have the authority to, to at least review the merits of the, of the appeal and make a decision on that. Uh, I know that there's uh, certainly cases that have been cited by uh, Mr. Schumadine, uh, but I think that the facts of this case are not uh, directly on point in that case, in which that case that was asking, uh, was looking at the, uh, the, whole, the decision process relative to, well, the court enforcement officer uh, decided not to revoke a permit. Um, and, and, and where this is different is, is and, and actually where there's some language in the, in the main <coughs> municipal code, is, is what we're asking here is that the proper procedure uh, with respects to what the town of Cape Elizabeth has said in an order what has to be f uh, followed uh, when uh, a, the, there's a non-confirming structure when you're looking to expand and when you're looking to do work in the shoreland zone, what we're asking is that procedure be followed. Certainly, if uh, at, upon the proper procedure uh, in which that is followed, if there's violations or if there's things that are discovered that can't be done, uh, I think the board will certainly have to make a determination at that point in time what needs to be done. Um, but that is uh, ultimately what is being asked here. And that's where the court has said uh, the Board of Appeals does have the authority to address all issues raised and to correct plain error when, when, it, when it is found. And I'll submit to you that's what we have today. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, Interestingly enough, too, one last point on this piece is that uh, our subsequent appeal uh, was filed timely. And, and, and again, there are some overlapping issues with respect to whether or not uh, the plans were accurate and whether or not this is a non-conforming structure. And, and should the board ultimately find, with respect to our second appeal, that there were error maze, errors made and the proper procedure has to be followed, it would, seem to, it would seem to make sense that we're doing that relative to, to both permits. Uh, with that being said, uh, again, with, a, with, with the first appeal, uh, there are essentially um, three items uh, that we feel were, um, were done incorrectly. Are you going to get into the substance now? Of, of, you want to hear the standing issue first? I think it might make sense for us um, to hear the standing and, and the timing and the, the timing of the appeal issues first um, from, from both sides, unless the board disagrees. It may be, and I'm not prejudging one or the other, that that may decide the issue. It may not. So it would probably be more efficient for us to, to hear those issues from you and from uh, uh, Makes sense. Schumadine, that'd be great. Excellent. Okay. <coughs> Good evening. I'm John Schumadine. I'm from Murray Plum Murray, and I represent the Livingstons, who are the permit applicant, permit holder in this case. Uh, I appreciate the board addressing the procedural issues first, because I think that really is what needs to happen is that those procedural issues are um, essentially jurisdictional. If you find that it's untimely, that's the end, of the end of the case. If you find that they don't have standing, that's the end of the case. We don't need to get into all the rest of, of the issues. Can I stop you there for one minute? Yeah, absolutely. The, the timeliness issue only applies to one of the two permits. The first right? one, yes, that's right. The standing issue applies to the second one. So. Uh, so we want to. We, I think it's it's a, it's the appropriate thing to do is to figure out those those questions first, and only then go into the, what's going to be a much longer proceeding to determine whether or not the permit was issued correctly. And I just like to state out right, right right now, I think we can prove with hands down that the permits were issued absolutely in conformance with every requirement in the Cape Elizabeth uh, zoning ordinance. I don't think we're going to have any difficulty proving that, and if we have to, we will. But before we get to that issue, the first issue is these jurisdictional issues. And I'll talk the first, the first one is the timeliness issue. And that applies to only one of the permits, and that's the first permit. What is the first permit? The first permit is the one that's the, what I call the alterations permit. 
it approves certain alterations within the house, and it also approves an addi uh, addition on top of the house. Uh, can we call it the top addition and the internal renovations? You can call it, yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's basically what it is. It's, it's altering the inter interior and the uh, roof of the house, roof line of the house. It's the house permit, right? The house permit, yeah, sure. Patio permit? Is sure, we can do it that way, too. Uh, however you, I mean, it really, it really doesn't matter so much, but the house permit. That's the timeliness issue. I really don't see where they get to get anywhere. I mean, I, I think you only have one choice here. For a number of reasons, you have to find that it's untimely. The first reason is that it's a judicial decision to apply the just cause exception. The Can way you that the me through the timeline, please. Sure. In fact, you, all you have to do is look at their permit their their appeal application. Their appeal application has the timeline in there. Building permit is issued on June 22nd, which means July 23rd under the ordinance is the date by which an appeal has to be filed. They found out, according to their own materials, they learned about the building permit having been issued on the 16th of July. In other words, they had time to comply, they had time to meet, meet the standard, they had time to file a timely appeal. They went to the town office on the 17th, so they actually saw the permit on the 17th. Again, they had time to appeal. Then follows a lengthy time in which they're basically deciding something, I'm not sure what, which includes waiting until sometime in August, or actually August 10th, before they even meet with their attorney, and then 12 days after August 10th before they file an appeal. Or actually, no, 14 days after they, they met with their attorney for the first time before they filed an appeal, because they filed an appeal on August 24th. That is over a month late. The way that the law works in Maine is you are allowed to hear appeals that are timely, which means appeals that are filed within 30 days. They don't meet that standard. That's the end of the analysis. There is a provision under Maine law, which Attorney Duchette has quite correctly uh, quoted that there is that, this provision out there, that allows for people to apply for a quote unquote good cause exception. The good cause exception stems from a long line of cases going back to Keating, including uh, Bra uh, Brackett and Viles, and it is all about uh, uh, extending the time frame when there would be a substantial miscarriage of justice otherwise. But most importantly, every case that has decided this, including Viles, including Brackett, talks about this being a decision for the judiciary. It is a judicial decision. So only a judiciary, only a court can decide that this is timely under the good cause exception. But even if you get past that hurdle, which I suggest you can't, there isn't good cause here. If you look at the only two cases that I'm aware of that have found a good cause exception, they all talk about people who only found out about the work after the appeal period had expired. In other words, in both Viles and in both Brackett, and in Brackett, you never had a situation, or you had a situation where once they found out about this permit being issued, there was nothing they could do. They, they had no ability, the time had passed, they could, can't go back in time, they couldn't meet the, the appeal deadline. There's never been a good cause exemption, or ex extension rather, that's been granted to someone who had the ability to meet the timeline, who could have, but chose not to, filed an appeal within the appeal period. And that is exactly what this case is. It's just, and, and it may seem harsh, but that's pretty much the way the law is in Maine. And in fact, prior to Brackett, I would have said, if you miss the deadline, you're, you're pretty much, that's it. Uh, there really wasn't any I mean, there was that, that language of substantial miscarriage of justice, but it was never, ever granted. So you really have to show that you fit, fit in a bracket. I mean, bracket is town of Rangeley, right? Yes. Um, can you talk a little more about the, what you were discussing earlier about only a court being able to grant the good cause exception? Yeah, all the, both Brackett and Biles and uh, Keating as well, I believe, say that this is uh, a decision for the courts in order to eliminate local uh, 
I forget the word that they use, uh, but it's basically <laughs> um, malfeasance, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, bias. Maybe that's the better, better, better word for it. So it is uh, in vials. I know that there's uh, some suggestion in Attorney Duchette's letter that the law court actually reviewed the board, of, the board of, uh, zoning board of appeals decision in vials for an abuse of discretion. But if you read the case, the actual decision that was reviewed for abuse of discretion was the superior court's decision, not the board of appeals decision. Uh, so I think. When you look at those cases, the line of cases, it's always judicial decision to be made, not a ZBA decision. Uh, but Are even there if holdings that say that ZBAs that have granted a good cause exception to the 30-day appeal period have been overturned on those grounds? Are you aware of any cases to that effect? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. I Are you aware of any cases that have held or overturned ZBA decisions granting good cause exceptions because they have held that that is something that is solely within the court's jurisdiction? No, but I'm also not aware of, of I'm not aware of any ZBAs granting a good cause exemption. It just, it, it. Uh, so your, your review of the law, it's only found cases where the superior court or, or, or an, a, an appellate court is the one that's actually made the reversal on good cause. You haven't found anywhere the ZBA, as a matter of first instance, was saying, ah, you know, close enough for government work. We'll let it. We'll let it slide, even though it was 30 days or whatever the whatever the deadline was. Well, Viles, they, they, they I believe Viles, they did find the, the ZBA did make a decision that was timely, and then the superior court made the decision to uphold that. Um, but it was the Superior Court decision that mattered. Um, and the Superior Court could easily have reached a, a different decision on that, that case. Uh, it wasn't bound by the ZBA decision. It wasn't required to follow the ZBA decision at all. Um, I know there's some suggestion that you just, you know, find that it's timely so that we can go through because why should it go up to the court and then come back? Uh, I, I, I understand the, that argument, but I think the problem is, is that you can't, get there from here because you can't find that it's timely. I mean, even if you get past this hurdle of, and say that you, know, you have the power to decide, at least in the first instance, knowing that a, that a court is going to review it basically de novo, even if you decide that, there aren't facts here that are even remotely like Brackett or Viles. Uh, both of those cases which, uh, are completely different from this case. In neither case did you have a situation where an applicant could have met the appeal deadline and did not. In both of those cases, you have an applicant who found out well after the fact and then immediately took steps. In one of the cases, immediately took steps and got a stop work order. Uh, and also, if you look at Brackett as well, you know, they talk about not just that the applicant has, or not the applicant, the appellant has acted in a timely manner, but also evidence that the town has violated its ordinance and also evidence that the, the permit holder has violated the permit. I mean, that's, that's the bracket case there, right there. Uh, I mean, ultimately, what I think we need to remember as well is that there are two sides to this thing. On the one side, you've got the rights of the appellant, who isn't a butter, and doesn't really have, you know, they have, hey, have an interest here, for sure. On the other side, though, you have the interest of the applicant the person who has received the permit, the one who has expended money to make changes to their building in reliance upon a permit that was not appealed in a timely fashion. What you are suggesting, if, you, if, if this case is a good cause exemption, I suggest to you, you might as well take a big black pen, go find the 30-day thing, and mark it out. Because it just doesn't exist in this case. If, if, if this case is your good cause exemption, every case is a good cause exemption. There is never going to be a 30-day appeal period. And that means that everyone who gets a permit should never build. <laughs> because as soon as you start building and someone finds out about it, then you're going to get an appeal and you've expended money and all of a sudden you're in this big fight and, you've lost your per and you could lose your permit and, and have you to go and, and undo a whole bunch of work that you've received. It's, it's just fundamentally unfair. Can you give a little detail from the cases that you've been discussing regarding what did qualify for the law court as a good cause exception? Well, if you look at Brackett as the key one, um, Brackett is the case where you have uh, neighbors who are out of town, work began while they were out of town, 
They came back in town, saw that the work was being done. They, they immediately complained, immediately sent a letter to the selectmen saying this is all wrong, uh, didn't get a response, and followed up and just filed an appeal. I think within, I don't, I don't recall the exact number of days, but it was not a tremendously long time period between first learning and filing their appeal. Not only that, but the permit that was issued uh, pretty much facially violated the ordinance. It wasn't, it wasn't a case of argument, really. I think, if I recall correctly, they expanded the structure, expanded the structure towards the water, which is pretty much big no-no in Shoreland Zone. And in fact, the third <coughs> big part of it was that he got a permit for a certain type of structure, started building that. I think he was repairing his initial, repairing his initial structure, started, re started repairing that, realized that there were other problems, and then rather than doing what he should have done, which is go to the court enforcement officer and get a new permit, just said, well, I don't care. I'm going to just build a bigger structure than the one I had in the first place. So permit violation, the permit violated the ordinance, and most importantly, the person didn't have a chance and acted promptly. And you have a similar type of, of uh, constellation of facts and vials. Uh, I, I can tell you that I've had a case that I thought met the good cause exemption that went up to the law court and didn't even get a, a, a written decision, got a memorandum of decision saying no. And in that case, my client came on a Memorial Day weekend, which happened to be the day after the permit appeal period had expired. He lived off-site, like in the bracket, cases and vials. Saw that work was being done. The permit itself allowed the permit holder to expand in the setback area to such an extent that my client initially thought the guy was building on his property and convinced the code enforcement officer to issue a stop work order because he thought he was building on my client's property. Once they worked out that in fact, although he was actually a whole two inches off of the property line, that stop work order was lifted and my client filed an appeal. And the law court said, no, not even, not even worth us issuing a written decision that does not satisfy the good cause exemption. If that doesn't, and if, if, if we're looking at vials and we're looking at bracket, that's what you need. And you just do not have anything close to that here. So uh, just to go back to your initial argument, though, your, your primary position is that we do not even have authority to recognize a good cause exception in this case. So for example, if the CEO EO had erroneously granted a permit to build a 12-story apartment complex, and people saw that construction began before the 30-day period, 30-day period passes, no one's appealed, we don't have authority to review that application or the granting of that application. Instead, it has to go to the Superior Court. I think what would happen procedurally is, yes, they would come here, you would have to say, I'm sorry, we don't have uh, the authority to grant you your good cause exemption. We're, so we're denying your appeal, and then they have 30 days to appeal to the Superior Court and get a judge to uh, issue a ruling. I think they can develop their record here, and I think they've done that. They've provided a chronology, and they've shown the facts that indicate what happens. But it's ultimately, it's the court that's got to make the decision to, to grant them the, the good cause. I mean, that's what they all say. They all say it's a judicial exemption. And so you're then therefore suggesting Naturally, the Murphy's remedy would be to go to the Superior Court with this. I think that what, what should happen today is that you should find that it's untimely, and yes, their remedy would then be to go to the Superior Court with us. Mm -hmm. okay. Why don't you talk to us about the, uh, the standing issue to okay. while, while, you're, sure. while you're up? The standing issue applies to the patio <coughs> permit. And the patio permit is. Uh, the, the actual work being proposed under that is, is really quite small. Uh, can I borrow you? I'm just going to illustrate what work is, work is being done because I think it's important. Can you see? And just, just before you start, just said, I know you didn't address this before, so we'll let you Thanks. get back up yeah. and speak your piece on that. We're not, we're not trying to cut you off on that. So. Uh, I'm just, just to show you what work is being was approved underneath the permit. There is a portion of driveway here that is being removed and replaced with grass, just so everyone can see. If, can everyone see? Just stand over here so I can. 
Uh, There's a photo of this right in the handout. There is a photo in the handout. Um, Maybe we'll do that. That will be. You got me. I don't know that we have an overhead projector, unfortunately. I don't think we do. All right, well, this is the photo that we're referring to, and I'll just come around and see if you get a quote. And that's in the materials that have already been produced to us, correct? Yeah, last, last handout. Yes, that's right. In fact, this is the, uh, that's the revision to the, uh, the permit that shows what work was approved as the permit was amended. Uh, so as you can see, if you look on the bottom of the picture, uh, you'll see that there are two sort of, uh, two, edges of, two ends of the U of the driveway one of which has X's through it. The X's represent pavement that was existing and under the permit is going to be removed. Okay. On the other side, you'll see a uh, area that's kind of behind the structure that has some X's out on it. That is actually a piece of uh, pavement that's uh, flat with the ground that has been removed as well. And in addition to removing it, some additional pavement was replaced in the same location but less, if that makes sense. The, if you have a pavement area that was, and I forget the exact dimension, so I'll just throw 15 by 10, what was replaced was 12 by 8 or something like that. So it's a smaller replace, the pavement that was replaced is smaller than what was there, what was removed. And that's against the house. That's right against the house. That is the area that is right against the house, all within the existing footprint of the impervious surface. And then the last, well, actually two more changes. From that place that was removed, and, and most of that pavement was removed, by the way. From that area that was removed, you'll see a series of X's leading down to something called an existing patio, existing deck and patio. That is actually a set of steps that go down to a patio. Uh, those steps were being removed as part of the permit as well. And then the last thing proposed under this permit, you'll see a uh, series of O's that goes along the line and in the right it says junction between rear property line and expired paper road. Uh, you'll see that the, those O's go along that dotted line those O's actually represent a rock retaining wall, an erosion control measure. Okay? Uh, so that is the work that is proposed underneath the patio permit. Now, almost all of that work, with the exception of the removal of the, uh, pay the driveway, is on the other side of the house from the Murphys. The Murphys cannot see it. There is no way for them to see it. The only thing they can see is the <coughs> pavement that was removed from the driveway. But even irrespective of that, I don't think I've ever heard an argument, I don't think there can be an argument, as to how any of that proposed work causes any harm to them at all. Although under that argument, wouldn't we be in the situation where any abutter or there would be no one that would ever have standing to challenge any uh, decision from the code enforcement officer permitting work done within the 75 foot setback? No, I, I disagree with that actually. Um, how would, it, how would there anyone ever have standing to challenge a situation like this? It sounds like you're saying no one ever would. Well, I think that, that it depends upon the nature of the work that's being done. Um, you know, if you're, which is actually, uh, I mean, it's quite substantial difference. If, let's say, they were going to build a house in that, that area, most likely any abutter who lives to the side of them is going to be able to complain about views, loss of views, aesthetics, um, 
you know, issues like that. The issue here really isn't so much, is, is really more of look at what's being done and then, you know. Uh, so uh, so uh, let me uh, more articulately phrase this. So uh, let's just assume that there is a violation of the shoreland zoning ordinance just for the sake of this discussion here. Um, if that violation is not visible to an abutter, your argument is that no one would have standing to no, I, I don't. That, that, that's taking it further than what I'm saying. I mean, I, my argument is quite literally predicated on the specifics of this application, okay? Because I understand that there can be situations where you can do something that's not visible, but that causes harm to an abutter because of increased traffic that causes harm to an abutter because of increased noise, it causes harm because of aesthetics, but that's the visibility thing. But there are lots of other ways in which you can cause harm to an abutter, even if it's not necessarily visible. So, so I, I guess my concern is that the point, from my perspective of the, all of the shoreland, I shouldn't say all of the shoreland zoning ordinance, but portions of the shoreland zoning ordinance is protection of the, the adjacent water body. And that is what the, the harm that is incurred in some sense when there is construction that's close to the water body. So here, if no one can actually see the construction that's occurring near the water body, the argument is in effect that no one has standing to challenge it, even if, let's imagine that there's a parking lot built there. No one else can see it. You have runoff going into the water. Well, you see that, you, you've just answered my argument. I mean, you're making my argument for me because if there's a parking lot, there's gonna be traffic. Traffic immediately causes, I mean, I'm Let's not go with tennis court instead. A tennis court is going to cause traffic because people are going to be traveling to the tennis. And I'm not. I'm not trying to be. Mm -hmm. I, I'm. I'm quite. I understand where, where you're coming from, and I and, and I and I respect that. But you really need to look at the specifics of this proposal. We're not saying, and we are not making. I'm not making a broad-based. You can't see it. You can't argue it. No way. Because you're saying in, in this instance the harm is so small that. I don't understand what it is. Can, I, can we talk about cases in which particularized injury can flow from harm to the general public or the environment at large? You can't. Can you talk about that a little sure, bit? Sure, it has to be particularized. That, that's the nature of the injury, is that it has to be particularized. You have to show that you have some injury that is in some way distinguishable from the public at large. In fact, that's the, uh, I don't remember how you said Nierkegaard, or, or I'm mangling the person's name. But basically, they said that they were, they were arguing about a parking lot, but they were not abutting the property, and they said, well, you know, it's going to cause increased traffic. But they didn't have particularized injury because they were just an undifferentiated member of the general public and couldn't show that it would harm them in particular. Now, that's really what you have to show. You have to show that there's a particular harm for the person who is appealing. And a butter does have a lower standard, it's very true. And that's, that's why I'm not making, arguing for a broad argument here. I'm, I, my argument rises and falls on the specific facts of this case. Uh, you know, you, you could, you start spending hypotheticals and change something even a little bit, and, I, it, and it probably would, would change things enough to make there to be standing. It's just, when you look at the work that's done here. So, you, uh, to, uh argue your side a little more than uh, to flip it around here, is that here the patio is of such a small extent that A, it's not visible, and B, any runoff impact that might impact surrounding abutters is such that the harm is so minuscule that there is no standing. Well, not to the Murphys. I mean, if, a, if the runoff were, and that, that would be another example, if this were, if the Murphys were actually next door to the property, and, and for instance, down, uh, down at elevation, so that the runoff was actually going over there, and then they could argue that the, the impervious surface would, would cause runoff, then that would create standing. But, you know, the other thing is, and I think this is really the important thing about this case, the runoff really isn't the issue here either, because all of this pavement, except for the patio up in front, was all pre-existing. And even the patio that's been replaced is replaced in exactly the same location as the grandfathered impervious surface. It's not new. So when you, you look at standing, you look and say, okay, here's the project, this is what's changing, and this is how it harms or, or has potential for harm. 
all we're doing is, is actually making the, pro the property less non-conforming because we're ripping up impervious surface. They aren't down, I mean, even if the runoff could somehow be a harm, that's for someone else, not the Murphys who are on the other side of the property and uphill. So that's, that's why you're not saying, and then the second part of the standing issue as well is that I think if you look at all of their arguments and all that they're claiming that's done wrong, they haven't claimed that we can't do what we got a permit to do. So even if you accept all of their arguments as correct, well, let's take the 75-foot setback. Even if they're right, which they are not, but even if they were, we're allowed to take up impervious surface and make the property less non-conforming. We're allowed to do it, even if it's within the 75-foot setback. That's all we're doing. They haven't issued any argument that if they are right on, requires that you reverse the permit. So, you know, where is the harm? So I, I just don't see that they're standing here and ask that you, on the second permit, you find that there's no standing and you, you deny the appeal. Any other questions? No. no. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, okay. uh, Attorney Wall is here to, to answer any questions the board may have from a town perspective. Okay. I guess, Bruce, I have a couple of questions, I guess, for you. Um, just going back to the... <coughs> The issuance of, of building permits generally. Um, those have to be posted, those permits have to be visible, um, at least my understanding is they have to be visible once the construction starts, is that correct? There's no requirement under the zoning ordinance to post it, but it, we generally do. There's no actual requirement. Okay. So, okay. So we do, we do, we do uh, put our permits uh, online uh, and we update them every Monday. Okay, but as far as posting the, the physical permit, you know, at the location of the construction, that's not a requirement of the town? It's not a requirement. It's, it's something that okay. um, we ask them to do. Uh, okay. Do we know in this case, uh, maybe this is a question uh, for, the, for the Murphys or, or, or for the, uh, the Livingstons, was the permit posted when uh, construction started? Um, I think we can resolve, uh, I'll speak real quick, uh, relative to the standing issue, and then I'd like to address a couple uh, issues regarding timing. But um, I think we can resolve the standing issue very uh, easily because there's a big fact uh, which is uh, being missed in all this. And, uh, and, and, and uh, Chairman, I did warn you that this would come up relative to the standing argument. Uh, there is a right of way. Um, that uh, is, uh, lies between the Livingston property and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and I think that's depicted on several of the plans uh, that you have before, before you. I think it's called Surfside Avenue, uh, which is, uh, and um, th there are times when I do agree with the Chairman Schumann and I, and we have been against each other in other cases. I agree with them that it's certainly a paper street, and I would agree with them that the town of Cape Elizabeth ha is, did not accept it. It's an unaccepted way. But in no means uh, did the right of way uh, disappear uh, relative to the, um, uh, those people who own lots in that particular subdivision. And I think it's, uh, every, I think most people know the case law these days that if you are a lot owner in a subdivision, you have the rights to all ways uh, and paths laid out in that subdivision. Those do not go away. Uh, and the Murphys uh, do have a right to that right of way. Uh, that argument was indicated in, the, in their appeals, uh, in which, and that's part of the issue with respect to this permit, was, uh, which was already mentioned, that the boulders uh, were uh, initially uh, planned to be placed in the right of way. It's my understanding that there's been an amended filing, although I would submit to you that the uh, paper scratch survey that was provided on uh, the patio plan is not a proper survey. I've yet to, we've yet to seen a proper survey relative to the patio plan, so I wouldn't be able to uh, comment on whether this new proposed movement of the boilers is now out of the right of way. 
In addition, what was something that was not even in the initial permit filing was the respect with the amount of fill that was going in back there. I believe there's something along the lines of about 12 truckloads, which has since been dumped. Uh, again, I provided you with some photos. So we're not talking about a small little project where we're removing a little bit of cement and replacing it. Uh, as you can see, it was a, quite an extensive project, uh, which is continuing ongoing today. Um, and there's some concern with respect to that fill also encroaching within the right of way. Uh, and again, the Murphys have a right to that right of way. Uh, they can see this patio, they can see the work being performed uh, so that it's not invisible to them. Uh, and thus, they, they have standing on, on, in this particular matter. Can I ask, um, <coughs> is, is what you're saying that the work that was being done at the property under the patio, what I'm gonna call the patio permit, yep. um, including the boulders and some of the fill that was placed on the property is within the boundary of what is shown as Surfside Avenue, a paper street on this plan? That is correct. Um, and in fact, there is a photo in which you can see, uh, and I don't know if the boulders are there yet, um, but you can see a pin, uh, and then again, you can see the, f the fill going beyond that that pin. Um, but I would, what I would present to you. Talking about this picture? Uh, I believe so. Which one? This one? <laughs> the last, second to last? That's it. It's this one? Okay. So. Can I ask another question on that? Surfside Avenue is a paper street. Do, are the Murphys claiming that they have any rights in that road that differ from those of the general public? Uh, yes. And what are those rights, and how are they different? I would uh, submit to you that the general public has no rights uh, to uh, Surfside Avenue. Uh, those, because uh, again, it was an unaccepted uh, way by the town of Cape Elizabeth. The only people who have rights to Surfside Avenue I think that quite a few people, uh, hence the reason why I think we have such a large audience here to this evening. And again, I don't really want to get into that argument, uh, but it's those people who live in the subdivision who have uh, rights to Surfside Avenue. Um, we'll, 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 we'll let you speak, ma'am. <laughs> give, give, give him a um, chance. So, uh, so again, uh, I think in terms, and, and another area where I agree with Attorney Schumadine is that uh, with respects to abutters and neighbors, there's a very little, there's a very low threshold with respects to proving that you've been harmed in some way. And it doesn't necessarily have to be economic harm. Um, it, you know, it, it can be however they may be impacted. And in this case, what we're concerned about, and what we're concerned about with respects to this, the entirety of this case, is that what we have is, um, is what we deem to be a, a non-conforming structure. And, and, and this is where it gets at the, the, the heart of uh, Attorney Schumadine's argument, which is, well, you know, it's, it, it, you know everything's fine here, and, and they're actually doing good things. And, and, and that's, not, that's not what the zoning board is tasked with. What you're tasked with is making sure that the procedures and restrictions are followed uh, and followed correctly, and that the code enforcement officer is also following those procedures. And when you have a non-conforming structure and work is being performed, then under your zoning ordinance, that has to go before the zoning board of approval. And in addition, the zoning board of approval can then make determinations relative or not to whether the, whatever is being done is, is meeting the setbacks to the greatest practical extent. That's language in your ordinance. Setting aside the kind of substance regarding sure. the, non the, the nonconformity of the property, which I don't think we're getting to yet. Right. I guess what I'm still struggling with is getting a handle on how the injury that is suffered by the Murphys from the patio permit is particularized to them, as opposed to something that injures a large group of people and therefore is not particularized. I, I guess uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to that question, unfortunately, with another question, which is if, if that's what the board is going to hold, then, then no one, when anybody encroaches into a right of way, and number one, I would argue that that's another violation of the permit because you have to have right title and interest to the property, and the bounds of their property don't even extend into that right of way. 
uh, without right title and interest, you can't do any work in that right of way. So uh, I, I want to touch on what you just uh, mentioned there. You, you, so you're discussing construction occurring within the right of way, but what's before us on the appeal today is the granting of the application. And that application, as it's drafted, as it, as it was put together, my understanding is, does not depict it being built within the right of way. But it is. So that seems like a Hence the re our only remedy is the final what? So that's a different violation than the granting of the application. So if an application is filed to build something at a particular location, and that is granted, and then someone v builds in a completely different location, that initial grant of the application might have been well and good. That's all fine. It's the violation that it seems like at that point the CEO needs to go out and say, yes, this is being built improperly and render a different decision that it's being built in a completely different location on someone else's land. And if the CEO refuses to make that decision at that point, that is what is then appealed to us. Well, Do I, I, I right? think that's, that's what's part of all of this because these issues have already been brought up to the code enforcement officer and in some in, in this instance he's decided to take no action but what's before us today is just the application for you the permit you don't have an accurate plan though which again gets into the entirety of the, the substance of all this but i believe the at least with the respects to um with respects to this particular patio permit i don't even think the right of way is depicted on that plan well I, good point I want to, I got a, I'm a visual person. I got a, I've got pictures, I got maps, I got decks, I got patios. I need an orientation. So can someone, I've got, for example, this picture with that patio, where is it? I think that goes to my question too, which, you know, to let's, jump let's, on that panel. That again, patio is not Can someone talk to me about where way. this stuff is that is allegedly in Surfside Avenue and what evidence you have that there is an encroachment into what you're claiming is the source of the Murphy's particularized injury Sir, because I don't have that information that deck is not a part of this appeal here today okay that's fine but I just like to know where it is on this map um, so anyone probably see a lot of these people back here in October but that particular that is in uh, I would submit, although there might be a, uh, a, a rebuttal to this, but I would submit that that deck is right dead center in the, uh, in, in the, right the surf away? side right away. Um, it's a 50 foot right of way, uh, which. Um, yeah, I see the right of way. I'm just, again, just yeah. trying to get a lay of the land. Um, but if, in terms of uh, speaking, and then, and actually that picture with the deck uh, shows, it's, a, it's an older photo, it shows uh, before the construction begins. Um, uh, you know the Livingston's house up to the left. Um, again, what I would uh, what I would submit to you is is uh, the the photo with the, the boundary pin, uh, and then it shows uh, I believe the the rocks uh, a part of the retaining wall, as well as the fill coming into the right of way, mm -hmm. and then and then I think there's a, a clearer picture of the of the the rocks and the, and the fill. It, and just to clarify, so there's a, there's a patio and there's a deck. They're two different structures, correct? Yes. The, pad, the patio is attached to the building. The deck is not attached to the building and is farther away from the building. That is right? correct. And the issue you're raising is the deck, but the application is for the patio, right? And, and our issue is not the deck. Our, again, our issue is with respects to the... A permit that was issued. On I understand. I understand. I'm not. I'm not right. I, okay. I, I apologize for my um, my, my choice of language there because I'm not attempting to get you to concede anything here. Uh, what what you're talking about as being built within the Surfside Avenue paper street is the deck, not the stone patio. The, well, it's the the, the retaining wall and then the spillover of the of the of the fill and everything. Okay. So the so boulders. That. Yes, correct. Okay, that is sitting on. Essentially, the it, it's sitting on the. I don't know how to say. It, I don't have a. We believe it's. Say, but that's sitting on the inside of the of the Surfside Avenue paper, right away. We don't believe that to be accurate. And again, because no survey was ever done. Okay. Well. Do you have any measurements? Do you have any documentation that indicates that the location of the boulders or the overflow fill is within Surfside Avenue? Um, 
A couple problems with that. When we met with the code enforcement officer as well as a, I believe, a construction representative of the Livingstons, when the Murphys met with them, uh, that very discussion came up. It was asked whether or not we could conduct surveys, take height measurements, and things of that nature. The representative for the Livingstons at that time said, I can't authorize any of that. So it does create somewhat of a problem in that we weren't able to access the, the property. There was, in the initial application, though, I do believe it shows, um, I mean, it's, there's some measurements on it. And based on the measurements, at least as far as we could tell, was that the erosion control retaining wall was, in fact, in the right of way. And that was based on, you know, looking at the, um, the, the, the again, without, without giving any credence to that, the 109 feet with respect to the mean high water mark and things of that nature based on, you know, feel if you. Okay, if I could just, I'm looking at a, at another map that was provided, I think by uh, Mr. Livingston to uh, Mr. Smith on September 19th, 2012 at 8.42 a.m. Um, which, seems, which seems to show erosion control boulder wall, which looks to be a uh, bordering the right of way. Is that, I mean, I'm not asking you, I guess I'm looking to, for the Livingston's of their council to, Thanks. sure, of course. Uh, yeah. So, you want me to discuss? Why, yeah, why don't you, if you don't mind, just going up to the, Mike there and take it, it's yours. Yeah, this, this, this shows the amendment. We talked about how the plan or the, the permit was amended and the amendment concerned the retaining wall. So what we did was we pulled it back. And what you'll see here on this plan is uh, a dotted line. And that dotted line is meant to depict the uh, the line of that paper street, and then you have the boulders on the other side of that, so, so on so the Livingston's property. So the record before us is that the application as amended and filed for and granted is the, involves a retaining wall that runs within the property boundary. Exactly. At this location. Yes, and we believe, we believe that as constructed, it has been constructed in conformance with that. Um, if Which there's, is a separate issue, I would argue. If, but the issue, I would of agree. course, on the application is that a, a wall granted, a retaining wall that's granted at this location, is that permitted and is there standing? To well, change? and under, under the permit, it is granted to be outside of the right-of-way. Do you have anything that establishes that it is outside the right of way other than this hand drawn drawing that shows a dotted line that represents the right of way and some circles that represent the boulder wall? Well, I think you're asking two questions, unfortunately. Uh, I have this, and I think that this does answer your question in that what is permitted Who under prepared that? Uh, this is the, the contractor prepared this. What, what the question under, under the permit is, is what is permitted? This shows a line. And it shows a line meant to depict something on the face of the earth. And that line, as depicted on the face of the earth, is the boundary of the right-of-way. And it shows the boulders in relationship to that line. And that is what's important here. It's not, you know, this is not meant to say that this is X number of feet from some landmark. It's meant to say that it is on the other side of that line. How now, close do you think it is to that line in terms of feet? It is... It, uh, close. It's close. It may be right on the line, the but it's... The reason I'm asking the question is because this picture shows the fill going over that wall substantially. And so to my mind, if that rock wall is essentially the border of the right-of-way, then the wall, the fill appears to be encroaching. Well, can I answer that question? Because that's yep. actually a separate question. <laughs> we need to remember that this is an easement. This is not a fee. It's not like they have a road that they all own. They have an easement. Maine law is pretty clear on what easements, you know, you've got the serving estate, who's the person who holds the easement, who gets to go over and pass and repass, or actually the dominant estate, excuse me, I messed it up, but the dominant estate who has the easement, who gets to pass and repass, and then you have the serving estate, who's the one who owns the land underneath it. 
the person who owns the land underneath it can do anything they want to in that land just so long as they are not impeding the ability of the other person to, to use it. Now, the only well, things in here... Can you relate that to the particularized injury standard such that these impacts are or are not sufficient they, they to are. establish particularized injury to an abutter? They, they simply are. They, they are not insufficient to establish particularized injury to a holder of the easement, certainly, because the only they are thing... Not, they are say? not. And because, and it's very simple, the only things in there that actually impact the ability of someone to pass and repass, which is what the, the, the owner of the land underneath the easement may not do. They may not build a wall to prevent someone from passing and repassing. That would, be, uh, that would harm the owner of the easement. They could do fill. They could you know, make the path easier for people to walk on. They could put grass down. As long as it's not preventing the person from using the easement, they're allowed to use that land any way they want to. The only things in there that could even conceivably affect the ability of someone to pass and repass are things that were there long ago and that are not part of what the changes are that are proposed under this, or, under this uh, permit application. What what, in fact, if you look at the permit application and what is proposed, it's removing stairs. It's removing barriers that, ha that actually prevent people from passing and repassing. To the extent it's relevant, uh, just because of the fact that you brought up the fact that this is an easement instead of a fee simple, who is the actual owner of this uh, region? But this is all we have in the record. Yes, who I know. Who's the actual owner of this region here? I would suggest that, w that the Livingstons are. And to the extent that there is any dispute about that, then the ZBA does not have power to, dis to decide that dispute, and it's a civil action. I guess I'm, you know, going back to the standing mm -hmm. issue on the patio permit, which is what I'm trying to get on board with one way or the other. Um, I hear where you're coming from in terms of particularized injury in terms of the patio work. I hear where you're coming from in terms of the boulder wall. Knowing that this is a really low standard, the fill within that right of way or easement area is still seeming to me like it might meet that standard. And so I'm looking for some more kind of discussion on that particular issue. Uh, sure. I mean, I think that what we're talking about in terms of the fill, in, in terms of the standard, is, is the potential <coughs> for particularized injury, which means some harm to some right that they have. Uh, the right that they have under that easement is to pass and repass along that property. Um, I think the issue is really, how does putting fill and actually, I mean, fill, once you put fill in, actually makes the surface more, the surface flatter. It's easier to walk on. How is that harming their ability to, to pass and repass? It's not like, I mean, you know, if, if the Livingstons had proposed to put a wall, even a wall that's, you know, like this high, you know, maybe the same height as Stonehenge and uh, this is Spinal Tap, that wall <laughs> would constitute some barrier. I think they would have an argument that that's particularized injury. But we're not talking about any sort of wall here. We're talking about lawn and fill that makes the lawn flatter. And, and I mean, I'd love to hear what, what the injury is. I just don't, don't understand <clears throat> how you can say that I'm harmed because now I can walk easier and don't have to trip. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sorry to be flippant about it. I just don't really, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding. I mean, if, if there's an actual harm there or a potential for harm, then they have standing. I just, and, and you know, we're not arguing that. It's just how do, you, how do you get to a point where, yeah, it's fill, but it's, we're entitled to put fill on our land as long as we're not interfering with their easement. How does fill interfere with their easement? On this picture? Yes follow up on, on some of John's questions. Is the right of way behind that desk, that deck? You mean where, where on the face of the earth does the uh, paper street such as it is right. exist? And understanding that you're not a surveyor and we're not, we're not talking with complete precision here, but just generally. No, and I'm, I'm not, I, and, and you know, I think uh, my understanding, such as it is, is that the uh, right of way or the paper street would be on either side of that, the boundaries would be on either side of that deck. 
on either side? Yeah, but the deck is not an issue in this case. Oh, understood. I'm just trying to orient okay. myself. So there, there are pavers that are kind of hard to see. So that is the patio that, that was... A separate patio from the... That is a separate patio. If you look at... Not the patio that's directly that's part of the application that's before right. us, but this is a separate patio, and the argument, it seems, is that that that's separate right. patio sits within the paper street. All right. There are a couple things about that, though. Now, if you look at this, this drawing, which... John gave me a minute. Mr. Thib Thibodeau gave me a second ago. John's okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> that patio is this structure down here. Which, so is is this? That's you see the the, the uh, excuse me. It says existing deck and patio. The patio that that you're referring to that those little pavers is this one right here. There used to be stairs to that patio down from the house. The stairs, as part of this permit, were being removed. The patio can't form particularized injury in this case because the patio pre-existed the permit, pre-existed the Livingston's purchasing the property, and has been there for time immemorial, as far as I can tell. And it's that is not the patio that is subject to the application? The changed patio is up next to the house. That is, that is correct. Right, right underneath the edge of the house right there? Uh, let me make sure. But I think sorry to First sorry to make. Exposed and then replaced. It shows yes. X's okay. and replaced. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. So back up there. Yes, that is, that is the one next to the house is the. I feel like we keep going around in circles a little bit, but with respect to the particularized injury, um, it, and again, uh, it, it's a very low th threshold. Uh, the Murphys have uh, a, a, a right of way, uh, and 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 again, whether it's uh, a, a visual impact or, or or anything along those lines, it's not just whether it's impeding their right of way or anything like that. It's it's the the threshold is how is uh, the improvements that are being done impacting the neighbors, and and what I submit to you is what and what we've maintained all along, the real harm here is the process and procedure that went about in terms of approving these permits was wrong. And so before the board, if the board today is going to say, you know what, this is the, this is the standard that Cape Elizabeth is going to set. This is, this is what we are going to allow. And to the extent that permits are issued uh, and, and proper surveys are not made, and for example, the uh, lock coverage was never even determined, uh, and we would submit to you that the lot coverage was exceeded the 20 percent, uh, if, if these things are not going to be followed and are not going to be presented and not going to be in the record, th that's, that's, that's the harm here. And the reason why Murphy's uh, have standing to bring this case is because they are the neighbors abutting this property and, and, and certainly have an interest in the, in the work that's being done and how those permits were issued. So, so the harm is the, the process? that was followed, not what's actually happening on the property right now? A little bit of both. Uh, with respect to the, again, there's the encroachments into the right of way. Two is the first, the, the first appeal, which is the height issue, which definitely impacts them. No, but on the, on the second one, on the patio one. I mean, the, the patio one is the standing issue with respect to Correct. do they have standing? Are you saying it's the process? I mean. When the, when the patio is finished, it's going to be smaller. It's yes, I think the, the, the letter from Mike Morris speaks to that. Uh, granted, we don't agree with everything he had to say, but he, he indicated how he had some, some real trouble with the fact that uh, procedures, the town of Cape Elizabeth ordinance was not followed in this particular instance, and, and certain procedures were done. And that's where I submit to you that that's where the, the town, of, you as the Zoning Board of Appeals have uh, have to kind of look at that in terms of how this ultimately impacts in the municipality. So how this then becomes a particularized, particularized injury as opposed to just a general injury to the public from violation of the procedures is the fact that it's a butters who are yeah, yeah, raising because it's, the issue it's, of it's the Because failure. it's the neighbors who have abut the property, who have a right of way in front of the property, who are being impacted by the work that's being performed there and have an interest in the work that's being performed there. And so, for example, if, 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 if it went through the proper procedure, 
uh, arguments could be made relative to uh, are the um, you know our setbacks being met to the greater greatest practical extent that they can be and, and being a, are, the, are, the, are the surveys proper are, the, are you know are the height establishments correct Is, you know are we uh, impacting our natural resources although we're just talking about the patio and the retaining wall yeah, I agree so but yes so, uh, so yeah. we'll set aside yeah. the, the and again to use now. attorney Schumann's word I don't mean to be flippant but in the, you know what's what's a minor issue to him is certainly not a minor issue to the Murphys. We wouldn't be bringing this bill otherwise. Can we go back to the, um, I know, sorry, um, back <laughs> to the issue with regard to the first permit and can we talk a little bit more about the timeliness slash good cause exception with regard to the timeliness of the appeal? We've got a timeline that indicates that the Murphys had actual notice of the building permit within, well within the time to appeal and did not file an appeal timely. Um, so to get around that, we need to look to a good cause exception or other exception that you might raise, and I'm wondering what information you can provide on Certainly. that point. Um, a couple points related to that. Number one, I, I think Attorney Sh Schumann and rightfully pointed out that the Viles decision was a decision in which the zoning board, the zoning board itself, did find that the appeal that it, appeal that was filed after the after the time provided in the ordinance was a timely appeal. The Superior Court upheld that, and then yes, the Supreme Court then upheld that. So I, I do think you're within your authority uh, to make such a finding. Uh, and it continue and it to be upheld by the Superior Court. Thanks. Um, two, uh, with respects to um, whether or not uh, th this rises to the standard, uh, yes, the Murphys were here. It's not analogous to the cases in which you had uh, somebody who was uh, one of them, which they were living in Florida and didn't know until they found out. But what's what's troubling in this instance is that when the Murphys, uh, and again, certainly they can speak more to this, and if you want to ask them questions, but when they approach the code enforcement officer with inquiries about the permit and and some concerns they had, uh, and that's and that's what's troubling here, and, I, and you know, and certainly if we have to address that on appeal, we will. But the the fact that. Um, that they were kind of uh, steered away. They weren't informed about an appeal process. They weren't informed about a procedure. Uh, and, when, and it was only upon their continued investigation and continued uh, um, inquiries relative to the code enforcement officer is when they determined, when they found out that, you know, oh my God, we've got to do something. Uh, I would submit to you that the first time uh, that was mentioned uh, was on uh, the August 1st meeting, uh, and it was at that point where the code enforcement officer did tell them uh, that there isn't a procedure, uh, there is an appellate procedure. Is there a copy of the building permit in the um, file? I don't have it in front of me. Do you have one? I do have one. And did the Murphys see the building permit on? The 17th, is that right? It was on the, the town 17th when which they went to the town office. Is the appeal period noted on the building permit? What's that? Is the appeal period noted on the building permit? No. Were the Murphys aware that there's a local ordinance? Uh, upon their in investigation. Yeah, I, think, I think you saw, um, uh, you saw in their material that they, they tried to bit of research. Um, uh, they're, they're both engineers, um, and, and so they, they looked at both the ordinance and state law. Um, and it was, again, a, that was, uh, well, that was after the August 1st uh, meeting. Um, and in addition, they met with uh, an attorney, uh, not me, um, uh, but then ultimately did retain me. But even prior to retaining me is when they filed their appeal. Were they unaware of the 30-day appeal period? Oh, yes. Well, they weren't aware that there was any 30-day appeal period until after August 1st, and which was the meeting that they had with uh, Bruce Smith and as well as one of the contractors.
And, and uh, I would just want to raise a couple facts here and make sure that we're all on the same page and agree on all of them. Uh, everyone agrees that the permit was issued on June 22nd, 2012? Yes. Okay. And everyone agrees that the, uh, the Murphys were aware construction was beginning prior to July 23rd, correct? Prior to, there, yes. Okay. And is there any dispute that the Murphys contacted uh, the code enforcement, code enforcement officer prior to that time but did not have an appointment until after that, until July 24th? Is there any dispute on that? Do you, do you dispute that point? So, so the, the undisputed facts here are basically the permit was issued June 22nd. There was some level of notice at some level prior to July 23rd. The code enforcement officer was contacted prior to July 23rd, but no meeting with the code enforcement officer happened until after July 23rd. That, that is correct, although I am an attorney, so I guess I'm just a little nervous about when you said there was notice provided. I don't know what kind of notice uh, uh, you're referring to. So let me, let me pull the word notice out of that conversation then. That's what happens when you have me up here instead of the Murphy. Sorry. Well, there's no doubt that they had, there's no dispute that they had actual notice on the 16th, right, when they sent an email to the code enforcement officer saying that they were aware of the construction. You're not, they did not. They, they had actual notice. <laughs> They had, they had actual notice that something was being done. They hadn't seen the permit at that point, and I think that's where, but they did see the permit the next day, which is on the 17th. In, in the Murphy's position is they were unaware of the window of time for the appeal until after the appeal period had expired. That's correct. And I guess I want to ask a practical question, which is, um, I guess, Bruce, this is directed at you, uh, were the, were the Murphys made aware of the, the, the appeal process in terms of what the town's appeal process is or the, or the timeline around that? I don't believe that. Would, would, would you or your office have, I guess, did you, te you know, tell them that? Or, or how else could they be made aware of that otherwise, I guess? Is there, in the course of a conversation, uh, we oftentimes get into, into ways mm -hmm. by which the audience will you know the, the the way things are done, but I mean it's not it's not common practice to to make that part of a, a, a permit application or, or or a conversation after necessarily. It's not information we we volunteer or I mean. I would volunteer if 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 if, if I thought it was uh, something that needed to be talked about. Yes, I wasn't. I mean, on the 24th, when we had the conversation, well, after, it was yeah. after, if it was after. The horse is out of the barn on the 24th. It's, I guess, but, you know, I, I didn't know if there were some side conversations that they may have had with I their officer. I don't, I don't recall that there was. Mm -hmm. So there, there's no set procedure that if you receive an inquiry that you automatically inform people that there is a particular window of time with, within which to. No, it. because at the time I had no idea that, that, that it was an issue. Mm -hmm. um, had I been aware of there's an issue and, and they asked what they could do, I would certainly uh, inform them based on the audience that, that, that there's a procedure that they could follow. Uh, but I didn't see an issue at that time. On the, on the initial timeliness issue, are, are we prepared to close the, the record and then have the debate and then probably reach out to the town attorney? Yeah. Okay. So, we want to ask if anyone else has any comments. There. Does anyone else want to comment specifically on the issue of the timeliness of the permit? I know we're doing this piecemeal, but it, I think it's probably the most efficient way to proceed. Just on the timeliness or the standing, not the, the other substantive issues. All right. Go to the podium. Your name, sir? Holy, um, 9 Pilot Point Road. They, uh, brought it up before and asked for a meeting with the code enforcement officer, which was not scheduled until after, so they had no chance. I mean, that's right away. By the time they can even meet with him to ask the questions, 
they're excluded from the process. And that's just completely unfair if that's allowed to, to stand. I, I just have a question with respect to, um, uh, her, my name is Sheila Mayberry. I live in the Trendy Point neighborhood. I have a question, I think one of you raised it, with respect to um, a personal right as, as an abutter versus uh, questions of uh, the setback protecting the waterfront, whether or not that it might be a personal right as a butter, but it's also a, a, a uh, right, it, it's also a concern that the town has to protect the waterfront. So my, my question is, are we talking about um, a timeline that has to do personally with um, the Murphys, or are we talking about the timeline, or is there a timeline where anyone can appeal an issue that has to do with the protection of waterfront. And, and, and I would suggest that because this, we're talking about waterfront property and we're talking about um, how we have worked as this town to protect waterfront property, that this should not be limited to uh, a timeline of an abutter who may have filed something late, um, but the issue remains one for the entire town because of um, our value that we put in and the work we put into the zoning ordinance. So I, I uh, respectfully ask you to consider that when you make your decision about whether or not they're standing based on <clears throat> the timeline. The other thing is, um, with respect to notice, apparently there have been a lot of permits granted. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think the town of Cape Elizabeth did, uh, which actually says display this card of work on principal frontage of, uh, uh, frontage of work. So there have been at least two, maybe three, that actually say display, and apparently none have been displayed from what I hear. So with respect to notice of the actual work being performed, I'm not quite sure there has been. And respect to the standing issue uh, with regard not to the timeliness issue, but I'm up here anyway, um, since the uh, Shore Acres uh, Association has an easement granted to it in 1992 uh, and is responsible for that roadway, the upkeep of that. We, we are actually obligated to make sure the roadway all along that area is kept up. We need to put gravel in where, where there's an actual road. Uh, so uh, when we have construction that is falling over into that roadway, we are actually responsible for it. And later on, when the, when the Shore Acres Association talks about that, I don't think it's in this tonight, I mean, what do we do with the deck that's in, that's in the roadway? Do we pick it up? I know that might be a civil issue, but this is something for you to consider when, when you think about the impact that this has. And so from a standing point of view, there is a particularized um, issue with respect to what we need to do, and the Murphys are part of that. So you can extend, you can extend, it, in the, extend it in that way with if you want to find a um, uh, low threshold for standing in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more thing. <laughs> Just because I think you need to understand um, the importance of, I'd like all the people in the neighborhood to stand up. This is the support you have for protecting our easement and our waterfront. Thank you. I'd like to say one thing on these pictures. I believe these one pictures, second. these photos were taken prior to the movement of the rocks, and that's why you see the, the amount of fill in front of them. The rock wall had been moved 
under the under the the revision to the build permit. These pictures were taken when the rock wall was first placed within the right of way, or would, would supposedly in the right of way, and they've been moved since then. Am I How correct? far back has it been moved? What's that? I'm just. Okay. just is, is, that, is that accurate? But wait. Okay. So what you're saying, Bruce, is that this rock wall is actually further back here now? It's been towards the home. I haven't been out to verify, but 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 this picture was taken when the original <coughs> rock wall was put in. And it's been. It, I guess the, the Livingston can can, can uh, speak to whether it's a different location. <coughs> is that is that accurate? Um, again, this gets to the whole process and procedure here, but. Apparently, in, in light of all this, uh, a lot of all this hubbub, uh, I believe uh, an amended application or permit was submitted. Uh, we haven't seen that. Um, and it was apparently granted. Uh, so I don't know if a new permit was issued. Um, and, and, and so I'm not, I, I'm not a, and I, I don't know if the, the rocks have been moved or, or not. When was the new permit issued? Uh, Excuse me? When was the new permit issued? There wasn't a new permit issued. This, this was a revision to the previously approved. When did that happen? Um, September 19th. There's a, there's a permit updated in the file. Okay. okay so, all, so all the pictures are, are, are pre moved mean as far as you know all you as, 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 as far as I know but it's my understanding that the the, the fill is still there and <coughs> I don't want to lose sight of the fact that uh, again all of this was done and then this was kind improperly. of to depict the post move um, apparently Am I correct in my understanding that there's another matter related to this that's going to be on next month as well? Uh, I, fortunately, I, I, I'm not involved in that either, but the uh, Shore Acres Association is, uh, I don't believe, are a little bit displeased with what's been happening in the, in the right of way as well. I guess I'm still not seeing the um, revised permit from September 19th. Um, and I wasn't aware of that when we were talking about the timeliness issue earlier. Although this is just for the porch, not the, uh, the patio. Okay. okay. Changing okay. Okay. my synonyms here. But Never mind. Yes. I'm all set then on timeliness. Yeah. Um, sir, I'm sorry. I, I, sorry for the, the interruption. I'm Nielsen. I live in the neighborhood fairly new to Cape Elizabeth, I, I wanted to go on record and, and ask a question, and that is why aren't building permits posted? I think all of this would have been quite easily resolved had it been posted. It, you know, is there a, could we have that done in the future, perhaps? It's not a requirement of the current, current right. ordinance as far as I know, so there would need to be an amendment to the ordinance to require that. Is that, is that accurate, Bruce? I know you said it before, but just for the record, there's there's no requirement to the best of your knowledge that it be posted, that's, correct? That's correct, and, and certainly uh, one could approach a counselor uh, to get that change, if you know if that's. Yeah, it's um, right or wrong. I, again, it sounds right. like it's not in the ordinance. For there are other instances, I believe, based on what else has occurred in front of the town council in the past, where certain changes do end up carrying notice, this one doesn't, it sounds like. And if right. right or wrong, that's what we're stuck with. We only have the tools that we have in our kit here As today. I said, I'd like to go on record saying that I think that's wrong. And I think as a citizen, I'd like to support others to um, suggest that this be done. Okay. It's... Anyone else? Council, can I ask a couple questions on the record? Um, do, do we want to? Just, yeah, How does it proceed with closing the factual record and then do we... No, let me just ask him a couple of questions okay. first. No, I, and I have those questions as well. Okay. Um, is there, any, to the best of your knowledge, is there any reason that would 
or a any prohibition on us going for a site walk on one, on one of these at, at, as a ZBA, as the entire board? Going on a site walk? Yes. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And is there any prohibition on us continuing a hearing, not necessarily on the entirety of the things that are before us today, but continue it so that we could do that to get, because I, I get the sense that we're all struggling a lot with, with, with what it looks like. I know I am, and I feel like we're sort of spinning our wheels here. So are we empowered to continue a hearing? I think you're allowed to suspend a hearing in order to be able to gain more information, and if that includes a site walk, then I think that would be okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make a, a, a procedural motion and um, that we suspend the hearing on the patio permit, which I believe is uh, 130072, until we have the next regularly scheduled. I have a couple. Uh, I have a couple thre threshold sure. questions I'd also like to ask of the town. Oh, absolutely. Let's, yeah, might yep. uh, obviate our need to mm -hmm. go ahead there. So, as an initial matter, this is. Um, in, do, did we want to close the factual record, or how, how do we normally proceed at this point? Or do we just continue now? Does anyone else have any comments on strictly on the, on the notice issue? If not, we'd like to close that. We're not, we're not done, but we have some questions for council. the notice was concerned we were told in the fall of 2011 by Sandra Livingston that we would be happy to know that they weren't going to be building up on their house and we said I said oh I'm so grateful thank you that's great when I went to walk my dogs and my neighbor said did you see what was delivered and they were floor joists for a second floor I was quite surprised so I went to the town office and I looked at the site plan. I'm a civil engineer. I have a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering, so plans are not foreign to me. I'm not aware of building permits and zoning ordinances. That's not part of what I learned. But I looked at the plan and I saw very quickly that there were some mistakes. And so I contacted, and my husband and I contacted Bruce, I called on the phone, and on that phone call, on the voicemail, I called the office, they put me to his voicemail. I specifically said on the 17th that I have concerns about what's happening at 29 Pilot Point Road because the average grade line is just there and there's no elevation. It's never been fixed to the earth. It's never been tied to a fixed object. And I have other issues that I'm concerned about. Bruce did not call us back. I followed up with an email on the 20th to say, we called you, you haven't returned our call. And the response was, I apologize for not returning your call. I've been real busy. And that's in the appeal um, package. And then it's just interesting that when we called into the office that the day that we were scheduled was the day after the 30th day. So then, Whenever approaching our code enforcement officer, I am not an expert on zoning, but I mentioned that the eaves are counted on August 1st. I mentioned that patios are, and he told me they're not. Well, they are. So I'm going to the expert that's supposed to help everybody, and I'm being told something that's out of the or ordinance. And so then I'm having to try to figure out, okay, what's true or not? Am I not reading this right? So I do feel that um, we did all we could to determine whether or not an appeal was appropriate. Um, and I do believe it was. The survey plans are lacking um, on both permits. And um, I mean, the process has been pretty tough, but I don't feel that uh, we should have, I think on the 17th or even when Bruce responded on the 20th, he could have let us know that there's an appeal process. On August 1st, I said, so what do we do? What do we do? 
do I call the town council? Who can help us with this? And he said, well, there's a process. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, you can appeal. And I said, oh, okay, how do I do that? And he said, well, you appeal and you can appeal and we have to look and see if there's good standing. That was my first notice, our first notice of that process. So I just needed to speak to that. Thank you. Thank you. If I may just say one <laughs> Yes. In all due respect, uh, I've been a court officer for 24 years, and I, and I think you'll find the citizens of this town contested to, to, the, to, to, to my validity in helping them on a daily basis. Um, there wouldn't be any intentional uh, wrongdoing to, to, to put you in a spot where, where you couldn't appeal. If there's a mistake that's been made, I'll admit to it. That's all I have to say. And I feel like I'm on trial here, and until we get to the facts, I think we ought to reserve um, uh, statements that may, may be bad to my, for my character. Thank you. I'd like to move to close public comment on the standing issue. Do I have a second? Seconded. All in favor? Okay. Um, Mr. Wall, sorry, I think. It's uh, quite all right. I think that Chris has some more questions for you. Uh, so, what are the. So, we now understand that there is an updated or amended application for the porch. What implications, if any, does that carry for the appeal on the porch? Do you mean from the uh, pur purposes of the standing issue? Uh, yeah, in the, uh, the appeal in its entirety for the porch, it, it do, it is the prior uh, granted application in effect null and void and replaced by now this new application that's been granted? Um, I believe that an uh, application can be amended uh, after it's initially granted. I don't, I don't think it, it vitiates um, the approval. It, it may create a different time frame if there's some alteration of the original permit that creates a situation that didn't previously exist and then the parties then have a new period from which to, to file an appeal if that were, you know, it, it, the timeliness were an issue on that. Fortunately, for, for this one at least, timeliness does not appear to be an issue. Right. Uh, I, I, I mention this just because of the fact that there did appear to be some confusion as to what is the actual plan. Where are the, are, is the wall being, uh, where was the wall, uh, the, the application approved with the wall's location? And because of the fact that that did change from the initial application to now the amended application, I just wanted to make sure that the amended application is properly before us to decide whether it was properly granted. Well, or is the only thing in front of us at this point the original application, which in many ways is no longer at issue? Uh, I, I believe procedurally what you've got here is an amended permit. Um, I believe, if I understand the timeline correctly, that the original permit with regard to what I'll call the patio permit um, was, the original appeal was filed before that alteration was made. It sounds like um, the appellants are still pressing their appeal, notwithstanding the fact that an alteration has been made. So it sounds to me as though that's the operative permission, and there's still a challenge to that, even as amended. And that would probably be properly be before the, the board at this point. Which then leads to right. your proposed motion. Right. Um, I, I, I would move. Well, let me explain what I'd like to do, and then I'll just move to, to do that. I, I think it makes sense to suspend the hearing on the patio permit, so-called patio permit, until the next regularly scheduled hearing, which I believe will be in October, and set up a time for a site walk by the ZBA and, I guess, any other interested parties, because I think that we would all benefit a lot from actually seeing this. Um, Mr. Schumann, do you... It is, is on the patio aspect of this, is there anything going on at this time? In other words, the rocks have been moved back, is that correct? Yes. And the patio has been put in? Uh, you mean the one up in the By the house? Yes. Okay, and the fill has been put in? Yes. And All it, work. Okay. All right. work is on the patio. Do you anticipate any more work on that aspect of this um, in, in, within the next month? Okay. Okay. That's as far as far as you guys are concerned. Absent some sort of order from the town or something else, that part is done. Correct. Okay. Thank you.
Okay. Why? My personal take on this, too, is that maybe we have some more discussion on the standing issue and see if we can rule on that tonight, given the information that we have in front of us, because my concern would be that, frankly, the fill is, to my mind, the best evidence of standing, and the evidence on that is what it is right now, and I wouldn't want us to do a site walk and have the conditions be different than what we have and have it be less fresh in our minds in terms of what we've gone through tonight in terms of standing. Well, is, and I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you, but isn't the evidence we have on that right now that we have pictures <coughs> and we have some plans and the film may or may not be along that line, but it has, regardless, it's been moved back so the pictures aren't necessarily accurate at this point? Well, to my mind, even if that wall was moved back, it's, to me, that only indicates that the fill is further within so, I mean, that kind of actually supports standing even more. Um, and, you know, given the minimal standing requirements. Okay. I'm, uh, I have no, no problem with that. Uh, thoughts from the rest of the board? I, I guess I'm not. I guess I'm not sure how that impacts the right of way. The fill? It, it does, yeah. How does that affect? anyone's use, you know, or ability to walk through the right of way. You know, based upon the pictures that we're, we're all looking at. Yeah, I mean, the level of particularized injury that's necessary for an abutter or other adjacent user with rights to the land is pretty small. I mean, I think there's case law out there that says it's almost nothing. And um, if you've got Phil, you know, you've got one person saying, hey, it makes it easier to walk. You might have another person saying, hey, it doesn't make it easier for me to walk. It's more difficult for me to get around out there. I think that the standard is so low, but that's really a question, I think, for town council. <laughs> uh, if you're asking, is that a, a relatively accurate statement of the standard? It's um, all it needs is a relatively minor adverse consequence is the language that the law court has used. Um, and in the context of building permits, the, the court often acknowledges that even conce conceivable injuries are sufficient um, for accounting for the fact that the work may not have been done yet, so we don't know exactly whether or not this is, will have an impact or not. So the court is, is willing to allow that kind of conceivability as part of the standard. Um, so it, it's, as been, I think, acknowledged by everybody, it's a relatively low standard for abutters. Um, to demonstrate some at least minor adverse consequence. Can I have, make one comment? Sure. I, I think it's important to understand that this area that we're talking about has been utilized by the Livingston's and, and former owners for years and years. It's been mowed, it's been maintained, um, so that th they're not doing in, going into an area that has not been used for years. By, by, by the owners of that house. So, uh, you know, and I think that's an issue that the town council can address. I don't address. think we want to get into adverse okay. possession discussions tonight. It hasn't been raised before us. Uh, I, I understand your point, but I guess I, I, w I would still default back to what I said. I think even for the, for the standing issue, I think just having an idea of what it looks like down there is going to be helpful. I, I agree. I don't, think, I don't think the hurdle to show injury is high. In fact, I think it's very small, but that being said, I just, I'm just not comfortable with my understanding of it at this point. So uh, I would move for us to continue the hearing on the issue of the timeliness of the house permit, uh, continue that today, and that we uh, suspend the hearing uh, on all issues as they relate to the so-called patio permit until such time as we can set up um, a site walk. Mr. Wall, is that something, uh, how, how, are there, 
requirements that we have for the notice of a site walk and that and that sort of thing. I don't. I'd know have that to double check on that. I, I don't know off the top of my head whether that's okay. true. Okay. And would you I've never had a site walk in 15 okay. years? Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to trust me. I'm not. I'm not eager to blaze new new territory here. But um, could we could we uh, ask you to to look into that for us? Because I want to make sure that we, if we are if we do go down this road, that we give proper notice to everyone and people who are entitled to participate are able to participate. Certainly. The the procedure that I'm familiar with is, is at this meeting you set the date up, and that's notice because anybody that, that's, that's interested is at this meeting. Okay. And, well, and, and, in, in terms of the site market, I guess you're thinking that are we going to allow more people to be there? Well, I think, I think Mr. Schumann said that for the patio stuff, there's nothing to be done at this point. Right, the patio, the patio and the retaining wall stuff, my understanding is that that's done at this point, correct? That's right. Okay. So no further alterations with respect to the bill and the recommendation we have. I don't think there's anything more to do. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I move that we, that we proceed that way procedurally. Do I, do I have a second on that from anyone? Yes? Okay. All in favor? Three of five, it looks like. Um, all right, well, I guess we're, that's, that's the way we're going to proceed. Um, sir? You have to come up here. You have to come up to the mic, please. I believe it was said that normally you would make the, set the date certain from this meeting, and if not, you would then have to notice the abutters. So if you're... But in this case, the abutters, I think, may be a little larger than you expect in that it would be basically all of the people who live in Shore Acres. That is why. That, 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 it, yes, and that, okay. that's a concern I have as well. I didn't want it to come as a surprise. No, I, you know, no trust me. It's, it's, it's very obvious that this is, this, is a, this is a hot topic for a lot of people, okay. and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Wall to do a little research on it because uh, you know, I think it's, if, <coughs> when we do this, we want it to be productive, and we don't want it to turn into a circus. Your word, not mine, but it, 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 it fits well. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, well. So we want to finish the vote to the last formal step. Well, it, if, if both parties are comfortable with that, I don't, I, I don't have any problem unless anyone else on the board does. Okay. I don't know. I think if we're, you know, I just keep coming back to if we're talking about seating out there. It's going to be torn up. It's not going to make any difference one way or the other. Well, no, I know. But what we're trying to figure out is what does it look like from a standing perspective at the time of the appeal, right? And um, the further out we get from that and the more changes there are, the harder it is to figure that out, right? Well, you know, if, if, ah. if, if, if understand, yes, yes. And if, if, if Bruce says that we, we should set it today, then let's, let's, set a, let's set a date now and let's do it as soon as we can. I don't know how we're going to get you down there. I know, right? I'll be hot. <laughs> you tell me it's easy to get through that dirt. <laughs> uh, before we do that, Chris, I'm sorry. You would go oh, uh, we had three in favor and abstaining or opposing? Opposing. Opposing as well. Okay. So two opposing. Okay. So, uh, the, the eyes carry it fairly, um, three to two. Um, why don't we, thoughts on whether we should try to schedule it now or whether we should go back to the, uh, to the notice issue on the other one, I, I guess. I'd rather schedule it now. Okay. Um, <laughs> someone throw a date out there. <laughs> Let me take a look at my calendar. Mine's in the car. Of course. You got it. Oh. You're not going to get it. Nope. <laughs> um, board members generally. It's Thursday, I get a walking boot. Okay, so <laughs> we'll go after <laughs> Thursday. Thursday. Um, your point is well taken that we want it to we want to get as good an idea of what it can look like as, as we can. So if we could do this next week. No, um, unless it's Tuesday. 
Let's do it Tuesday. Tuesday works as long as it's prior to Wednesday. Tuesday um, is prior to Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to check. <laughs> I'm going to go out so That's the that. quality representation you get here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, just, just for the boards, uh, I'm, I'm uh, on seminar next week, so. Okay, so, so you're unavailable on the I'm not available. Okay, all right, well then, why don't we. And, and is there a requirement that we provide at least two weeks' notice prior to something like this? Because. Okay. If you, what was the question? Do we have to provide two weeks' notice? No. Okay. No, this continuation. Because it's a continuation. Uh, okay. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong, John, but I believe as long as you, it's notice. Sure. The meet, meeting is suspended and carried to the site walk. Yeah. Got it. How about uh, Tuesday the 9th? Um, actually, I can do that. Okay. That's a scintillating business here, guys. I apologize. For <laughs> that, that works the for me. Yeah. Uh, exactly, right. We don't want to lose the light. So um, look at a tide table. Let us know when high tide is. Good. <laughs> yes, October ninth. Let's say 4.30. 4 4.30 on um, the 9th. Yeah. Okay. We'll meet at, meet at the property, out in, in front of the property. Is that acceptable? Yeah. Is that acceptable to you? Okay. And uh, we will confer with council and the interim and get some guidance on the actual parameters for this. 4.30. Just ask a question: Is there any procedure for filing uh, a party in the interest application on this particular appeal? Okay. Nor, nor am I aware of one either, ma'am. All right, so we'll, that we'll doesn't mean that there's not one. It's just that it's so we sit here. So we could file something, and you would consider. You would consider that as. I don't know. They're, they're, I think they're having trouble with that issue. <laughs> I, I, I think all we can say to you is you can file some sort of objection and then we'll take it up in the ordinary course. You know, beyond that, I can't say what, what would happen next. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, timeliness. Is that ready to move on to timeliness? Yes. Yes. Um, I think we'll, uh, we'll not move on to the issue of the timeliness as to the, to the, uh, to the house permit. Um, we've closed public comment, so I guess it, it's, it's what, what thoughts we have on it. And I have a question for the mm -hmm. town attorney. Um, one of the main issues that was raised here, it seems like at the end of the day, this is really a legal issue that sits in front of us as opposed to a factual determination to be made. Um, although I understand that if one were to de determine that, oh, a good cause is available, to us, the ZBA, then it would begin to mix in fact. But just as an initial threshold matter, what is your opinion, advice to us as to whether we, as uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, have the ability to recognize good cause to waive the uh, window for filing an appeal? My review of the cases indicates that it's not something that it can be done administratively. It can only be done by a court. All right. The, um, the quotation that um, Attorney Schumadine was struggling for when he said uh, met, whether they messed up or something like that or, or to concern about the administrators messing up is um, um, we have decided that the application of the good cause exception is a decision to be made judicially rather than administratively to prevent local arbitrariness is the term the court used. 
So obviously it, it was not involving Cape Elizabeth. Right. <laughs> the decision. And this, and this, and this sentiment, uh, if not in those words, has been repeated by other and other law court decisions where they indicate it's a judicial determination to be made at the superior court level rather than at the board level. And would it be your, uh, with the understanding that it sounds like your, your advice is that this is an uh, a ability that the court has that the administrative body lacks, uh, would you nevertheless recommend that we should make particular findings of fact of any sort to aid the court if anyone were to choose? I think that all the board can do is indicate the reasons why it's making the decision it's making. Um, the way I read the decisions, the, the avenue that's available to the board is to dismiss the appeal as untimely and to indicate the timeline or the reasons for, for doing, reaching that conclusion, basically. Um, and then it would be up for the Superior Court to hold a hearing to address many of the factual issues that have been discussed uh, by the persons here to see whether or not uh, it would be appropriate to apply the good cause exception in this circumstance. Um, just, it, my, my impression of this is, is though I don't necessarily like it, I don't necessarily agree with it, I think that uh, I agree with, uh, with Mr. Wall here, I'm not sure that we have any discretion to look beyond the 30 days here. It just, it's, it, the, the language of the statute is what it is. There's, I, I'm unaware of anything in the ordinance that says these are only suggestions, or you know, you can you can reach outside the parameters of what we say here in, in extreme situations. So, as I sit here right now, um, I, I'm inclined to rule that the that the appeal in the house is untimely. And I would agree. I think it boils down to at at its core, the problem is that the ordinance itself doesn't have any notice requirement for abutters for particular types of projects reaching a particular level and it just is not an aspect of the ordinance and because of that or maybe not because of that but for whatever reason the appeal was not filed until after the time period had passed and as you noted and as the town attorney has noted it appears the ordinance has no uh, leeway granted to us the time has passed it's outside of our ability to to address the issue yeah i'm actually uh sympathetic to uh, the Murphy's petition. Um, and uh, just to full disclosure, I live across the street from the ocean. Um, but, uh, and I do think someone mentioned earlier that, you know, there are some procedural things here that, um, you know, again, from, so I like to say on the board, I'm, I'm the non, I'm, I'm the non-attorney on the board. So I, everything to me is a practical equation, and uh, not that it's not with my esteemed colleagues, but, you know. um, but I think that um, there's some things that, like, you know, po the posting of the building permit. Some people don't like to see building permits on their houses when they're doing renovations, but um, I think that's a cue. I think, you know, perhaps we need to look at, you know, putting um, something in there about people's rights to appeal building permits, whether it's on the back of the building permit or something. I mean, there's some, some things here that I think need to be looked at. We, we don't have much latitude, as, as I think both Chris and, and David have mentioned, um, you know, we, as far as the appeal period. Um, but I think, uh, and, and f you know, for that reason, um, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I think that the 30 day uh, appeal period has, has come and gone, but I, I think that the town needs to look at, at, at some of the procedures under which um, building permits are issued and, and making um, the citizens aware of what the relative rights may be um, to appeal permits in the future. So. I agree with John. I mean, you know, I am likewise sympathetic with regard to um, the fact that folks have to go into the ordinance if they're not familiar with the fact that there's a 30-day appeal period, but at the same time, the ordinance is very strict with regard to the 30-day appeal period and the timeline here with the permit issued on June 22nd, actual notice to the Murphys on July 16th of the work being done under the permit, and then the appeal not being filed until August 24th makes it incredibly impossible for us to kind of look beyond the requirements of the ordinance with regard to the 30-day appeal period. 
I, I would concur with the thoughts of the board that I'm very sympathetic to the um, appeal as well, and at least the ability to have you know your voice heard and an appeal considered. Um, but I mean, I, I read the the ordinance the same way that the uh, town council does, and um, it's it's very strictly worded, and there obviously could be. Um, you know, further discussion you know, outside of the board uh, about, you know, changes so there could be better notice and better opportunities for, um, you know, abutters and other interested parties to appeal these sorts of decisions. But uh, the way it looks in the ordinance, it's, it's, it's pretty black and white. Um, I think that um Joanne has put some of the findings of fact on that, that we think are, are germane on the record already here. Um, but I'd, I'd reiterate a couple more of them before I think we <coughs> that, that I'll move for a vote that on June 19th of 2012, um, the Murphys um, filed a permit application uh, for their property at 29 Pilot Point Road to renovate existing interior and add 1,038 square feet second floor addition um, that permit was assigned building permit number 120452. Uh, that permit was approved on June 22, 2012, um, as issued and applied for. Um, uh, based on the, the chronology submitted by uh, the Murphys themselves as part of their, their appeal, um, I think it's undisputed that they had actual notice of the construction um, prior to the, the expiration of the 30-day 30-day appeal period. Uh, I believe that looking at this, it looks like uh, August 16th, I'm sorry, July 16th of 2012, they had, they had actual notice. And I guess I would incorporate by reference into our findings of fact, um, the chronology that um, the Murphys have submitted as part of their application here. And based on that, I would, uh, I would uh, move that we, we vote on the issue of whether this appeal should be dismissed because it's untimely. Um, I, I move to dismiss the appeal um, with some regret, but nevertheless move to dismiss this appeal on the grounds it's untimely um, because it was not filed within the 30-day window set forth by the ordinance. Um, all in favor of dismissal? Do we want to vote on the findings of fact first? Um, should we rule on the findings of fact, Council? Or, the, or, or is it sufficient what I put on the record? Okay, okay. Well, maybe we can do it this way to, to, to expedite it a little today. I, I, I put some findings of fact on the record uh, a moment ago um, about the chronology and, and, and other issues I think are relevant to, I think the whole board thinks is relevant to the issue of the timeliness of the appeal. Um, does anyone have any um, issues with, the, with those findings of fact as I put them on the record? Uh, are we all in favor of the, those findings of fact going into the record as submitted? Yeah. All in favor? Okay. Um, did we have a second on it? Did we have a second? We I did. second it. We have a simultaneous second. Si simultaneous sec a second and a third. Um, uh, all in favor of in, in those findings of fact being put into the record, all in favor of uh, dismissing the appeal as it relates to the House? Number 120452 on the grounds that it is untimely. Second motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, that, that, that appeal is, uh, is deemed dismissed. Um, we, as we talked about earlier, are going to have a site walk on October 9th at 4.30. Uh, Mr. Wall is going to provide us with some additional guidance about how we should, how we should organize that. I'm, I'm, is that a communication you can provide directly to us or? Okay. Okay. And um, that's, that's our next step on this and we will, we will suspend the hearing on the patio permit until the next regularly scheduled ZBA meeting which is next month. And I believe that there might be another related issue on, on the docket as well. So uh, I would move to adjourn this hearing. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? So fine.